This yes. is an open public meeting and has been so advertised. Uh, it is a virtual open public meeting, uh, but again, it has been advertised as that. And uh, with that, I'll ask Mrs. Coleman to call the roll. Mrs. Riley? Here. Mrs. Falpel? All right, what's up? Here. Can everyone please mute themselves? Mrs. Butchko? Here. Mr. McMillan? Here. Mr. Taby? Here. Mr. Fink? Here. Mrs. Marmion? Here. Mr. Schaefer? Here. And Mr. Stotts? Here. Okay, there's Thank no you. executive session at this time, so we'll move right to, uh, oh, we, we have to do the flag salute. I'm, I'm sorry, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag salute. Uh, if you'll stand uh, uh, virtually and uh, salute the flag, uh, we'll then move on from there. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we'll uh, skip section two and go to uh, section three presentations, the uh, SSDS report initially. Uh, I don't know who does that one at this point. Uh, is that you, Dr. McDowell, or is that uh, someone? Nope, that would be me, Bill. <laughs> okay, it's Ms. Bolden. Um, this is gonna be a very short report. So that's a good thing tonight. For our reporting period one, which was September 8, 2020 to December 23, 2020, we had zero harassment, intimidation, and bullying investigations. So there were zero, and there were also zero incidents leading to student removal. We did do training as required, um, and our training was done on September 2nd with our welcome back with staff. Uh, we talked about our HIV policy. Um, we also talked about the Bullies to Buddies philosophy that we implement here at Oakland School. Um, on September 11th, we did our GCN anti-bullying law training for all staff. Um, and then on September 30th, the teachers did training with the students um, just on, you know, our character ed program, a little bit about our HIV policy and kind of what that means, watered down at a very elementary level for preschool through fifth graders to understand. Um, we also implemented our new social and emotional learning curriculum, which is a uh, part of this report this year, because that is another program that we hope will help us uh, decrease the incidents. Um, and then we had some programs that support our harassment, intimidation, and bullying, um, anti-bullying initiative in the school. We had our week of respect activity, and we always team up with OMASAC for those activities, and we did the same this year. Our teachers um, put some lesson plans in for the older students on Violence Awareness Week. We focused uh, on Red Ribbon Week again this year as well. And during Red Ribbon Week, we focus on healthy living and building positive relationships in order to stay away from drugs and alcohol. But those positive relationships also help us decrease the number of HIV reports we receive. Um, and then again, the program we're doing with SEL is ongoing throughout the school year. So there are lessons that are implemented um, on a weekly basis with the teachers in the classroom. So that was our trainings and programs part of the report. And for the investigation and incidents, we had zero. So again, not much to report, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, Jen, very good. Anybody have questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll uh, roll right along to uh, the next section, which I believe is the presentation of the uh, reentry plan. I I'm sorry, reentry is not the right word uh, for, uh, opening fully the public school. Um, I thought we were doing the budget first. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, <laughs> every, can everyone see my screen? Okay, we're gonna yes. do a budget presentation now. That's, <laughs> that's gonna be Mrs. Coleman. You got it, Beth Ann, go. Thank you. So um, only a few slides tonight, um, presenting your uh, Oakland budget for the 2021-2022 school year. Your total uh, budget is $8,745,529. Um, local budget, your general fund budget made up of uh, revenues of tax revenue, 5.4 million, state aid of 2.8, budgeted fund balance. Those are funds that uh, we've, we saved from prior year, expenses not made. Um, Rental income, this is um, $41,000 of this 45,000 is income 
um, that you generate by renting space to Collingswood and withdraw from uh, capital reserve. And this is the expense side of your budget. Hold on, I just, so instruction is 82% of your budget, student services and student services is child study team, health, one-to-one um, -one aids and so forth. Uh, it's 10.3% of your budget. Administrative costs are 4.7% of your budget and facilities is 2.78% of your budget that has gone down um, from the last uh, couple of years. That's as, as a result of the bond referendum passing. We have less and less things that need to be done. The only thing in the budget as far as facilities is concerned this year is um, a, uh, getting a new generator. Sorry, I'm letting people in and trying to do this at the same time. It's not fun. Okay, um, prior year tax levy, 5,388. Next year's tax levy, 5,469 for a 1.5% increase or $51 per year on an average home assessed at $175,190. Your average assessment did go up um, from prior year. So it's $51. Um, and I just bring this up just so the community is aware of some of the things that you do to save money um, and to save money year in and year out. Um, Collingswood and Oakland sh share a multitude of services, including child study team, speech, custodial, maintenance, all administrative services, curriculum, data reporting, technology. Um, and then in addition, you're a member of a lot of joint purchasing co-ops and alliances. And um, you also provide a special ed education teacher to Collingswood. So on the flip side, Oakland provides Collingswood with a shared service and then Collingswood rents space from Oakland, which generates um, some revenue for you every year. Um, very brief, but the budget is on the agenda this evening to be approved to go to the county office for review and approval. And then once it comes back from the county office as being approved, it'll be on in the April agenda, um, a more in-depth uh, budget presentation and a, the pub, pub public hearing with the final passage of the budget. And that is the budget. Any questions? Can we just make the comment, the administration and the maintenance portions of that, uh, that budget uh, is outstanding. The percentages are, are so much lower than the averages in the state that uh, uh, that's just terrific. It's, it's hard to believe we could be that much better than everybody else, but we are. And that's nice and, and it's good on both districts because we share, we're able to keep our administrative costs low on, on both sides, um, which is very helpful when enrollments are, are going, you know, kind of like this. It does help to yep. kind of spread the cost out a little bit. Okay. okay anyone with any questions on there? And you guys can see my screen. I did put the agenda back up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, hearing Perfect. no questions, we'll then go to the important dates section, uh, which doesn't have many important dates. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, early dismissals for, car, uh, for conferences, uh, March 22nd, 25th, and the next board meeting is April 27th. Uh, spring break. Uh, I should know this date, but it's like April 9th, maybe something like that, uh, which led to a lot of questions last night. But uh, we, we have the same uh, same calendar that Collinsville does. Uh, okay, moving right on. There's no unfinished business at this point in time. And we'll go to the first public comment section. Uh, this is for Mr. Stotts. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, we got to go up. You have to approve the minutes. Can you see my screen? We have to approve the minutes oh, from the February. Now, yeah. I'm going to have to check my glasses, I guess. Yes. That's okay, all right. In that case, we have we need a motion to approve the minutes of uh, the February meeting. Is there a motion to do that? Moved. So moved. And a second. Okay. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or corrections on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so moved. Now we have no unfinished business, and so we'll go to the public comment sector. Uh, I appreciate all the help I can get. I obviously need a whole lot of it. Uh, uh, after spending all night up and participating in Collingswood's uh, 
board meeting. Uh, I'm tired. Uh, uh, you've but, got you've got one person. You got Adam 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 Share who would like to speak. Okay, Adam, you got it. Go ahead. Hi. Good. Good evening, Adam Share, uh, 18 West Beachwood Avenue. My question is, um, with the tax levy being 1.5, which is under the 2%, are you able to bank the half percent cap, or is that lost? Uh, that would be banked. Yes, we are banking. Our 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 banked cap um, is now about three hundred and forty thousand dollars in Oakland, as of today when I when I revised when I revised the budget. And you can hold that sort of like a rainy day fund if things go bad, right? We can, years. but only for a period of three years. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Adam. So just just to clarify, and Beth Ann does this repeatedly, but. Uh, that bank cap, uh, it's not a, a pot of money laying somewhere. It's a pot of the ability to increase taxes by that, uh, that amount. So if we ever needed to use that, the taxes would go up by the amount that we had to approve it. Uh, had to approve right. it. The amount that we're backing, banking this year is not money that, that's in the bank. It's a percentage of uh, tax increase that we can do in future years. Right. It's, it's money that we're not paying that we could pay in the future if you needed it, but we're not paying now. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay, anyone else? I don't see anyone. If you want to give it another minute. Uh, no, because we'll have another section later in the uh, uh, meeting where they can come back in and do it. So we'll move right along to the superintendent's okay. report. Uh, Dr. McDowell, you're on. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will start with uh, item 7.01 which is the enrollment report. Um, as of February, 2021, we were at 274 students. Uh, February of 2020, we were at 284. Um, attached uh, is also the school safety drill report um, for um, the month. Uh, there are no, there's no suspensions, uh, no bullying report established. Also attached is the uh, CST child study team uh, report for February. Um, in addition to uh, the nurses report, which looks at some of the uh, health services and indicators, the bus emergency evacuation drill is also attached. Um, and there are no policies uh, requiring a first read. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, we'll go to section eight, which is the committee of the whole. Is there a motion to go into the committee of the whole at this point? So moved. Second. second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are now in a uh, committee of the whole. Uh, there are two items that uh, have been discussed that, or have been uh, requested uh, be put in there, but uh, you can also add anything you want at this point in time. Uh, the moving back to an in-person meeting uh, was, was my suggestion. I would very much like for April uh, to go back to in-person meetings. Uh, I, I think we have adequate space for uh, distancing, be it either three feet or six feet. Uh, and with masks, uh, I, I would like to go back to in-person meetings. I would like an opportunity to uh, see the members of the public who uh, want to address the board. And I would like an opportunity for the public to also see the board in, in action. So that, that's my thought. Uh, questions, complaints, comments? Uh, I second that, Bill. I think it would be great if we could uh, be back in person. Uh, I think it would be beneficial to us as a board and to the community. So I'd be in favor of us meeting back in person next month. Very good. I, I would abstain. I have, I have children that I have to take care of on Thursday nights. Um, and I feel it's somewhat hypocritical if we can't get back into school that we go into school for meetings as well. It seems to me that Zoom meetings are working out just great for me. Um, I would have to get a babysitter, uh, which isn't the end of the world, um, something I'm willing to do, but yeah. Yeah, Jimmy, just a question. Maybe I misunderstood you, but I thought you said Thursday night. Our meetings are on uh, Tuesday night. Oh, Tuesday. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, no, Tuesday nights I have children I have to take care of and I have to put to bed. Okay. So. Bill, I would just say, I think we should consider that we do want the public to participate. And I would hate to put anybody in a position that they felt like they cannot because they don't feel comfortable for whatever their health extenuating circumstances might be. Just, and I'm not opposed to it 
in the near future, I think I'm, I'm a little hesitant for April. Yeah, I mean, right now we have 40 people in attendance in this meeting. So I don't think we can pack 40 people into the, the library. I agree with them. I don't think that it's, I think until we're sh sure that everybody would be in a comfortable place. I mean, some of us may be vaccinated and not have a problem, but April's, I think, a little soon. I mean, just a note too, that what, what my, the... my intention would not be to meet in the library, it would be to meet in the uh, cafetorium. So there's a lot more room in there. I think we could uh, uh, adequately. Uh, I, th I think the Zoom has allowed us to be, reach more people than it has in the past because of things like the fact that they have kids and other things going on. And right now with everything being so like, so important that the accurate information is out there, as much as I want to see everybody face to face, I think that um, what we're doing is actually bringing in more people and getting more information out there than if we were in person. One, one of the things, you know, that, that I would propose, uh, you know, clearly if we, if we go back in person, um, there, there'd be a limit on how many people could attend in person. Um, so I guess it would be a first come first serve kind of thing for seats. But, um, you know, moving forward, I think, you know, one of the one of the great benefits or one of the good things that came out of COVID um, is, is uh, the integration of this type of technology. So I, I, I my vote would be uh, to do both, to, to come back in person, yeah. um, but then also to uh, live stream um, the, the board meetings as well. Um, so that, you know, folks who, uh, you know, may not be able to attend in person or if there's not enough seats uh, based on social distancing that they can still attend. Uh, virtually, um, you know, I think that the increase in, in turnout uh, as a result of, of the ease of kind of just logging in from home uh, for the community, I think, has been a great benefit um, to everyone. Yeah, I'm with Rich. If we can do both, I'd be fine with it. If we have to pick one or the other, I think we really should stick with Zoom for the time being. And if we have to find a, a middle ground, um, to Rich's point, I mean, we've doing hybrid instruction as teachers perhaps we can take a hybrid approach to the the board meeting um you know if that's a a happy middle ground that can be effective uh then maybe that's the direction we we go yeah i have no problem i, like that. I, I i'm perfectly willing to to do that it's just like the board itself to, uh, to meet in person i would also point out that the zoom meetings while this meeting is very heavily attended this is also unusual, even for Zoom. Uh, even with Zoom, we have two, three, four people that normally show up. Uh, yeah, my, my point, Bill, would also be that with the reopening discussion that's uh, you know gathered almost 400 people last night and 40 people in Oakland, um, this is going to be an ongoing discussion, which is going to probably get bigger and bigger as we walk into September. So I, I feel like the meetings are going to get pretty involved um, moving forward. OK. Um, I'll chime in just for a sec. I just support what Rich was saying. Like I would also support um, the board going in um, and live streaming it as well, because I do like the fact that we're able to reach more people. Um, the one question I have is a logistical one. So it would be something for um, Ms. Bolden and facilities, but I know just kids is in the building. I don't know how late they're there. So I don't know if that would affect the time um, that we could meet if we have to push it back to seven, um, just so that they can clear out the building and clean before we get in there and they set up. Um, I'm fine with that too, but I just wanted to throw that out there as a consideration as well for moving back in person. I know we'd have to meet in the cafeteria. I just wanna make sure that they have um, time to prepare for us. Good point. Would, would it make sense to just use the next few weeks to figure out the logistics and see what's possible and then look to yeah, do I was just I was just going to recommend that I was yeah. I'm going to reach out to the tech team tomorrow I know in the library I think it's a little easier to do that type of thing than possibly the cafeteria but I want to talk to the tech team because I know we tried to do that in the beginning um, and there was a lot of feedback if you're yes. on your you know if you're too close to each other and you're zooming that you get that feedback so I just want to make sure that it's a good experience for everybody and everybody can hear and participate. Um, yeah, we, we, we definitely have to watch, uh, you know, keep, keep everything muted when we're not speaking. Uh, right. Yeah. There's or, a little use headphones, you know, folks have their right. set up. Yeah. So I'll do, I'll do some homework 
in the next day or two and then send out um, recommendations that the tech team thinks would make it work. Um, I guess I, I think the library is probably more suited to it because the cafeteria, I think at the ceiling, I just, I'm thinking of like the echoing, but I'm going to let them chime in. I don't want to. Sorry, this might know, be. And then we'll know. I don't know if this is a bad idea or not, but could we do what the students are doing and I'll be on Zoom on Chromebooks in the room together and then people we, could join the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did Rather that. than like live streaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the approach uh, in, in Glassboro that, that we've done. We've simulcasted uh, that, you know, they're using uh, WebEx for that, which is a whole nother issue, but uh, I prefer Zoom. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, each each board member, re regardless of if they're live or not, are, are logged in, um, same as we are here. Um, but again, like if I if we were all unmuted, like Chris and I right now are both unmuted, we'd be getting all kinds of feedback if we were in the same mm -hmm. room kind of thing. Right. Um, so there's definitely some logistics that we would uh, need to work out. Um, you know, if, if we're going to, you know, it might even be worth, you know, maybe uh, playing around with it dur during committee meetings, you know, if we were to all log in just to see, right. you know, how, how that feedback piece would work with Zoom. All right. So I'll, I'll reach out to my tech in the next day or two, and I'll send, I'll send you guys some options of what they think we um, might be able well, to do. One more question. Um, would this be a situation where if a board member couldn't make it in person, they could be on Zoom and that would count or no? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. I think yeah, I believe yeah. so as well. Yeah. yeah. Because I uh, I have my 97 year old mother that I'm helping to take care of and we cannot be in any anywhere where anybody could possibly give us anything at this particular point until the whole family and everybody else is inoculated. And that won't happen until the end of April when we're sure everybody's had their first and second shots and had the two weeks. And so, okay, good. Wonderful. That would work out well. Perfect. Okay. I'm happy with that. We, get, we have the ball rolling. We're going to do some work and see what we can do. And uh, that's mm -hmm. great at this point in time. That's, uh, that's fine. Yeah. All right. And just oh. uh, in the chat there, we got a couple. Uh, Ms. Bolden chimed in that uh, those kids are in the cafeteria until six. Um, so, that, you know, would have implications for cleaning and that uh, as well. Yeah, Bob asked a question the about that cleaning. Yeah, I'm more, I'm more concerned about the staff cleaning up after us because I'm, I'm definitely afraid of infecting any children. Yeah. I mean, I'm not worried myself. I've had the shots, but I want to make sure it's clean after we leave so there's no way children can get sick because of us. Mm -hmm. I don't foresee that being an issue. Uh, we have cleaned up uh, at the high school behind athletic events. So we would do the same procedures. We would use the electrostatic sprayers to uh, disinfect the chairs before we put them back on the, the racks. Okay, good. Uh, but then in addition to talking to the tech folks, obviously it'd be a good idea to uh, uh, involve Keith and us too to make sure that uh, we're not stepping on any toes anywhere. Yep. That we're gonna present a problem. Okay, the next item is... Uh, Wait, hold on one second. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Back to the reopening. Um, I know uh, Dr. McDowell has a presentation to give. Where's that on the agenda? Is that... Uh, it's a different agenda that Collins would use, than Collins would use last night because it was before the first uh, right. uh, public yeah. comment. We can do it here, probably. I don't know if they added a separate item to the agenda for the presentation. Well, I had, I mean, uh, me and a, and a few other board members have talked about a couple of things that we'd like to comment on that to maybe mitigate some of the community comments at the end. Um, if we could kind of address some of those questions first, but I don't know how many people have seen the presentation and know about it yet. Okay, so, so uh, we can do it now because that is the next topic for discussion. Um, okay. Dr. Dr. McDowell, um, I think you've got co-hosting capabilities. I do, I do. So you can share your screen and. Yes. All right. Okay, can we see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so thank you again uh, for the opportunity to talk about um, school reopening. 
I know that this is um, a very challenging time. Um, so this is a very pertinent conversation that uh, we are happy to engage with and thank you for the opportunity. So to get us started, um, would like to make sure that um, there is very clear and concrete understanding that we only have one goal as a district. That is to fully reopen schools. So it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when it is uh, safe uh, and appropriate to do so. So uh, we want to make sure that the community um, understands that our day-to-day -day is planning for a full reopening, um, making sure that we are adhering to the science and making sure that we are taking all of the variables and factors into consideration for a safe uh, but steady uh, return to full in-person instruction. The um, item that I would ask for all of us uh, here tonight and moving forward uh, would be just one, one, one request, and that's to assume positive intent. Um, our now president, uh, Biden, back in 2016, uh, among other speeches, made a statement that you can fundamentally disagree with the person's judgment, but never question their motives. You get along a lot better and you make more progress. Um, we believe as a district that the community is united in the fact that everyone wants what's best for the children within this district. And we may disagree on our process, but our collective intent is both honorable and justified. Uh, so to state again, our district goal is to return to full-time in-person instruction as quickly and safely as possible. Um, and I will have several of our uh, leaders participating in this presentation. So to, to take us back, we have reached multiple uh, milestones, uh, some positive, some not so positive within the, the continuum of this virus, but it has officially been a year since the first reported case in New Jersey. So at that time, school buses and classrooms were packed with students, businesses and restaurants and venues um, were uh, packed with customers. And we were all unaware that in short proximity, life as we knew it would be placed on pause. Uh, in the beginning, there were 159 cases nationwide. Uh, but a year later, New Jersey has seen over 712,000 confirmed cases. In Camden County alone, there have been more than 40,000 positive cases with substantial loss of life. Um, such numbers don't take into account those who are still fighting with significant respiratory and cardiac symptoms months after being infected, as well as some of the children who currently suffer from multi-system inflammatory syndrome businesses that were permanently closed or the mental health crisis that has emerged due to the social isolation of quarantine. In short, our state does not look the same as it did a year ago. Um, it has also been said that addressing the impact of this virus will be the greatest operational challenge of our generation. Uh, we're, it's gonna take a bit of time. Um, we asked for continued patience, but we have to stay vigilant and we also have to stay focused. But despite this setback, uh, we have been um, equally committed in working together as a community to use the appropriate data-informed steps to reduce community spread, but fully acknowledge the burden and the, and the significant challenge that this has placed on families and caregivers. And we appreciate the support as we work through some of the logistics with a safe return to full person instruction. We also want to um, remind us where we've been, beginning of the year. So back in August, we, in, we introduced a welcome back plan. And within that welcome back plan in August, we were all in a full remote learning environment, but we had a phased transition into uh, hybrid learning, which is in-person instruction. There were four core areas of concentration, one being conditions for learning, leadership and planning, policy and funding, and ultimately continuity of learning. So moving in, so since September, we have been operating in a hybrid environment. Ultimately with our goal is, was to, uh, at that time, to ensure that every family had the opportunity to be able to have some form of in-person instruction before the end of the school year. We released a survey or a community check-in um, back in September and we released something very similar in March because we wanted to be able to contrast and compare the findings. And we're gonna share with you some of the findings that uh, resulted in that data collection. 
So removing pre-K responses, we had roughly uh, 1,981 total responses. When you break that down, we had 232 responses specifically from Oakland. With a population of 274, this is a, a very large turnout. So that speaks to the level of engagement within our community. So thank you to our community for providing feedback with this check-in. But we also wanna make sure that we're removing any and all confusion associated with why we chose to collect this information. The purpose of this short survey was to, was to check in and was to get a, a read on what we needed to plan for. Uh, we will be um, uh, crafting a more detailed and comprehensive version once we release our reopening plan uh, because we want your feedback and we want um, uh, for you to be continually engaged within this process. So when we look at um, the students that were participating and the families are participating in this process, uh, we do have a percentage uh, of families that with children who have IEPs. So they are also represented within this data and they account for between five and 6% of the total student population. We asked the question around preference of model, whether that be uh, synchronous, which would be live instruction, asynchronous, which would be recorded instruction, um, or a combination of the two, or, or either as a, as a preferred model. So what we see for Oak Lynn is that uh, 148 of the respondents, which translates to roughly 66%, um, made, the, made the preference of live in-person instruction. Uh, 64 of those families, 28% indicated they were okay with either, and 5% indicated that they were uh, more interested in that remote level environment. We also asked a question around preferred schedule. When we think about uh, level of access to in-person instruction, there are multiple categories, and we'll get into that a bit later, um, but the uh, idea, the options that were presented for, for this particular survey were what, what currently existed at the time that the survey was administered, which was two days of hybrid learning in person, full remote as a continuation, or four days of uh, in-person instruction based either on programmatic need or expressed extreme hardship. So that data indicated that 10% of families prefer to stay in a two-day uh, uh, hybrid learning model. 61% indicated that they wanted to see a significant increase in in-person instruction um, of the four days. And 28% indicated that they prefer to stay uh, in a remote learning environment with no in-person instruction. We also asked a question um, around satisfaction with the full understanding that uh, satisfaction in the midst of a global pandemic, not satisfaction in terms of, are you satisfied with the model, but satisfaction in the sense, are you satisfied with the level of service that you're receiving in this challenging time? And in Oak Lynn, um, roughly 70% um, of our uh, respondents indicated that they were either satisfied or very satisfied, which really speaks to the level of work that our uh, outstanding educators are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to meet the growing needs and demands um, of our community. When we think about our community, it's very important that um, we don't pit uh, uh, groups of individuals or groups of constituencies against one another. So we felt that it was important to share who are the consideration groups to inform our planning. Um, our district is balancing the need to make choices informed by the evidence and ultimately the, the demands of our school communities. And we're actively engaged in a thorough review of what the science tells us while balancing the lived experience and perspective of teachers, of support staff, of parents and caregivers and students. So using the science to be able to inform what this looks like. One special item of note when thinking about our consideration groups was that we as a district, we were able to partner with uh, Jefferson Health uh, in order to provide opportunities for um, our educators uh, to be um, elevated or, or expedited in terms of 
ahead of the line in order to get them vaccinated as quickly and safely as possible. So we were able to facilitate that process and within our respective communities, we had over um, 140 um, of our educators that were able to take advantage um, of that particular service with subsequent opportunities in the near, near future. When we talk about um, expansion, um, not we are not in a, a, a state of reopening because we have been open. So as a district, we opened in September with a full remote and then transitioned by October into a hybrid learning model. Some of our uh, neighboring uh, organizations have yet, to have yet to open. They have been in a full remote environment uh, for the entire year. We're not comparing ourselves to them, but the federal definition of school reopening constitutes one day a week of in-person instruction. We believe that that's too low a bar, uh, but we just wanted to make sure that we're um, using common language and that we are clarifying. So what are we using to guide our decisions? We're using the uh, operational strategy for K-12 schools through phase mitigation through the CDC. We are also on a weekly basis monitoring the CDC COVID tracker for Camden County not for the state of New Jersey, but specifically for our county. We are also referencing the New Jersey Department of Education uh, restart and recovery guidelines within this pandemic structure. In addition to the New Jersey Department of Health COVID-19 activity level index, which tracks and measures uh, viral transmission in the Southwest region. The Southwest region being um, Burlington, Gloucester, Salem, and Camden County. So what's informing um, our process? When we look at the CDC's threshold for community transmission, there are four categories of transmission. Blue, meaning low. Yellow, moderate, which shows uh, a, a total on a seven-day continuum of 10 to 49 cases. Orange, 50 to 99 positive cases in a seven-day continuum and high transmission, which is red, which is over 100. The indicators are based on county level data over a seven day period. So where does Camden County fall? Camden County as of March 11th on a seven day continuum had 170 cases per 100,000, which translates into Camden County being in the area of high uh, uh, community transmission. We have, there has been uh, a, uh, uh, an increase uh, in the level of uh, cases coming within our county. Uh, and when you look at, at that, there are a couple of mitigation strategies that have been recommended by the CDC that we are currently following. Under the category of red, as well as orange, Elementary schools should be operating in a hybrid mode with physical distancing of six feet or more required. Middle and high schools should also be operating in a hybrid learning mode or reduced attendance with physical distancing of six feet or more required. Um, we believe that in order for us to um, adhere to the science with the understanding that our, our region is yellow but our county is red. Um, the two mitigation strategies that we are leaning very heavily on above and beyond the disinfectant, the cleaning, um, or the universal use of masks, and also the physical distancing in our schools in order to um, mitigate the spread uh, within our schools. So the standard that we have been using as a district, which has kept uh, the transmission low, if not non-existent is the same standard that we're currently uh, proposing that we continue until the guidance changes. I think that it's important to note that uh, this is a fluid situation on a weekly basis. Uh, Camden County superintendents, all of us, we meet with the public health officials and the Department of Education in order to review the data and review the guidance for the next week. So we are operating on a seven day continuum. Every seven days, uh, we're looking at decisions that need to be made. 
And once we have new information, we will make new decisions and we will make the necessary adjustments and, and changes. I think that it's also important to note that um, there has been discussion, at least at the national level, around easing of CDC guidelines as they relate to physical distancing. Um, this has been a discussion. Once we have uh, definitive information that is supported by our public health officials, we will make the adjustments and then that will expand levels of access to in-person instruction. So where are we now? Currently, we have three learning modes. We have students that have, or families that have opted to participate in a full remote environment. We have a cadre of students that are participating in a two-day hybrid in-person environment. And for some of our highest need learners or those experiencing extreme hardship, they are coming to school four days uh, in person in a hybrid learning environment. How are we preparing for expanded levels of access to in-person instruction? Um, we will hear from our uh, business administrator on some of those investments, as well as some of our other leaders on how we're preparing uh, uh, to expand and increase levels of access. Uh, in February, we received notice from the New Jersey Department of Education um, that we were getting an additional round of relief funds, the elementary, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. These funds are allocated uh, in three ways. The main allocation, $368,014, um, is pretty much a wide open allocation, can be used for facilities work, um, windows, doors, HVAC. And as you know, we just did a bond referendum bond referendum in Oakland that basically took care of all of that. Um, sorry, turn this off. So we will be meeting with the Finance, Buildings and Grounds Committee to determine how, how best to, to spend those funds. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, and then we get $25,000 that the DOE is determining we should be spending for accelerated learning. Um, and Oakland and Collingswood uh, the, these funds are going to be focused more on summer school for at least the next year or two and bringing kids up. And then every school district um, was allocated $45,000 for mental health support and services. All of these funds have been allocated in the budget, um, the 21-22 budget. And then um, once the grant application opens, we will be meeting with the administrators um, on how best to uh, budget these funds and use them for the children. And then again, with the 368,000, we will be meeting with the Finance, Buildings and Grounds Committee. Once I know exactly what the department deems as al allowable ways to spend the funds, um, we will meet and uh, make those decisions. Thank you. Yep. We, will now, we will now hear from our uh, head of uh, Buildings and Grounds. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you see listed on the slide, uh, we. The, this is what we're doing in the classrooms to try to mitigate the spread as much as possible. Um, we have hand sanitizing stations set up in each room. Uh, the doors are left open throughout the day to increase ventilation, reduce touch points. Um, we have signage posted in the classrooms and the hallways to promote uh, measures on how to stop the spread of the germs, cover your sneeze and cough, wear a mask, uh, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, et cetera. Um, we also have a hand sanitizing station set up near the door in the room. Uh, all desks are spaced at least six feet apart and where possible turn to face the same direction. We have walking paths, uh, directional arrows taped on the floor in the hallways uh, to keep people distance while they're traveling throughout the buildings. Um, we also have a lock supply cabinet to store disinfecting supplies uh, so that we meet uh, right to know requirements and has come requirements as uh, laid out by the state. Uh, each student's belongings are separated individual cubbies. Uh, that would just be like uh, Rubbermaid type containers that uh, during the winter months they would put their coat and now that this weather's getting nicer, they can put their backpacks, their personal effects in. And uh, once the weather does get nicer, we do allow staff to open their windows to increase ventilation as feasible. So if it's, uh, we have some more nice weather like we had last week, we should be seeing some more windows open. Uh, additionally, uh, back in uh, summer of 2020 uh, with custodial uh, summer cleaning, uh, there was an initial assessment was conducted um, 
All rooms throughout the district were set up to maintain a six feet of desk between the, or six feet of space between student desks. Uh, we went back and reassessed the classrooms uh, the end of February, beginning of March, uh, to establish we could increase the number of students per room while still uh, maintaining social distancing guidelines. And in a few instances, uh, we could rearrange the furniture in the room to make uh, uh, additional space for one or two students. But the vast majority of rooms are already set up for maximum occupancy while maintaining uh, the six foot distancing. For uh, cleaning and disinfecting protocols, uh, the district uh, purchased additional COVID related supplies uh, with funding provided by the first round of the CARES Act. Uh, this included personal protective equipment, uh, additional cleaning products, uh, MERV 13 filters, hydroxyl generators, uh, desk shields. Uh, we have uh, clear uh, PETG, which are food grade plexiglass shields uh, installed on all student desks as a barrier. And throughout the day, uh, school, cust school custodial staff are utilizing, uh, utilizing electric static sprayers to clean high touch areas and the restrooms and that occurs every 30 minutes throughout the day. And again, all areas are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected on a nightly basis by our night custodial crew. And finally, for HVAC and ventilation, we are following uh, HVAC guidance set forth by ASHRAE, that's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, their references could be found on their website, and I will link that in the chat section for the end of the meeting. Uh, so what we have is all district HVAC equipment is monitored uh, daily through our automation systems to ensure that everything is operating as designed for building occupancy. Uh, current recommendations are maintaining, uh, to maintain your indoor humidity levels as close to 40 to 60% as possible, and we are meeting those standards. We've installed high efficiency filters uh, in all compatible uh, air handling units. And additionally, we've increased uh, unit run times to uh, uh, bring in more fresh air and turn our changes over within the room. Typically during a normal school year, uh, the buildings would be in an occupied mode from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. We are actually running 24 hours a day, five days a week. We start the units up at uh, midnight on Sunday night and leave them run midnight uh, till through midnight Friday night in order to keep as much fresh air going through the buildings as possible. So they're the steps that we're taking as far as buildings and grounds are concerned. Thank you, sir. Um, we're gonna hear now from Principal Bolden on the learning schedule for students as well as the, uh, the curriculum. Hello. Uh, well, currently, as you know, for the first and second marking period, our instructional model included all of the core subjects, meaning social studies, science, math, our balanced literacy consisting of readers and writers workshop, word study, read alouds, small group guided reading, and strategy reading lessons. Um, we have also been placing an emphasis on our social and emotional learning curriculum. So the shift comes at this time where our teachers are finalizing plans for a revised instructional model to achieve the goal of increased time, specifically in the areas of math and guided reading. By doing that, we are also creating additional opportunities for our academic support teachers and our INRS intervention specialists to work with kids in the area of reading and math. Um, and we are also expanding the office hours which will provide additional time as well for the teachers to focus on math support, writing support, and reading support at the end of the day. So the hope is that these adjustments will support teachers and students by increasing the ability to work in small group settings. While the teachers are in small group settings, that gives them the opportunity to measure um, the student growth and the progress more frequently. And then when we have that data, we can use that data to drive the instruction in order to better meet the individual needs of our students in the area of math and literacy. Because right now our students are at varying levels um, because of uh, this remote hybrid structure this year. Some, some are doing very well and some need that extra support. So putting the students in small group will really help out with that. So in the area of curriculum and instruction, I will try to e explain all of these uh, educational terms on the screen for you. Um, the Connected Action Roadmap is just an approach to strengthening teaching, leading, and learning. So our teachers work in what we call PLCs. That's really just a group of teachers. Sometimes it's just one specific grade level. Sometimes it's various grade levels because we're trying to align where they left off at the end of one year and where they need to be at the beginning of another year. 
And I like to think of the car model as actually building a road, um, meaning we're putting all the pieces together to build that road, that road that the students are gonna take to get to, from point A to point B from one year to the next. So right now we know that some, the students might have some gaps because we have not been able to cover all of the instructional material in every single grade level this year. So we are trying to figure out the best approach um, to kind of wrap up the third trimester, what, what, what the big concepts are we should be focusing on. And then for the start of September, where is each grade level starting? So the teachers are in the process of, of building those roads right now um, so that we can get there. And they're going to do this by looking at data from the formative assessments, the benchmark assessments, the anecdotal notes, and really taking a um, close look at where our students are and where they need to be. As I stated in the last slide, we are prioritizing the content focusing mainly on literacy and math. Um, we are also fostering independent work practices by improving what they call the gradual release of responsibility. And specifically for our younger students, we're trying to make them a little bit more independent. So what that means is we're gonna follow the um, I do, we do, you do model, meaning the teacher does the mini lesson, maybe a little guided practice, and then sends the child off, whether it's a remote child or a hybrid child, to work independently on that skill, to practice that skill, to reinforce that skill, to reflect on that skill. Um, and we, we really need to have the parents on board with that because the students who are home remotely really wanna build their stamina for that independent work time so that they can you know, really, I guess, maximize their own instructional time when they're focusing on a certain subject and activity on their own for an extended period of time. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. We are also gonna continue building relationships with the students and fostering those family partnerships. Um, and that's where we stand. So that, that's the plan moving into third trimester. And I'm sure this will also be the plan that we work with starting to plan for September. Thank you, Ms. Bolden. Ms. Bolden. Um, we're now gonna hear from Dr. Whitehouse regarding the considerations around our special education students. Um, so our students in special education programs often have very highly specialized needs um, and work with multiple professionals within the school system. So one of our priorities from the beginning of this current school year was to provide as much in-person instruction as possible for our students with the highest levels of need. Um, and this was to maintain the integrity of their individualized programming, to provide consistency and routine for academic instruction, as well as their behavioral needs and therapeutic intervention. And for the students whose families chose for them to work remotely, our teachers, child study team staff, and support staff worked really hard to find new strategies and programs that um, could meet our students' needs who were working in that format. Uh, it's also worth noting in special ed, um, the New Jersey Special Education Code requires smaller class sizes for self-contained and pull-out replacement um, programming. And so this allowed us to make these decisions for in-person instruction while maintaining the recommended health guidelines. Uh, beginning in September, students receiving self-contained services began attending in-person instru instruction. And by the time our hybrid model was fully implemented, um, the self-contained students were allowed to come in for the full amount of in-person instruction. So most students receiving self-contained services were in four days. Um, and then for pull-out replacement, those students were um, coming in for some in-person instruction in September by appointment. And then they also were offered up to four days of in-person instruction throughout the fall months. So the next steps for special ed with the upcoming changes in the district schedule, we'll be able to offer five days of in-person instruction for students receiving self-contained and pull-out replacement services. So um, self-contained can start five days the week of April 19th and um, students receiving pull-out replacement will be able to start five days the week of April 26th. Um, for social and emotional learning in Oakland, um, as part of our efforts to recognize the importance of SEL and address um, students' um, learning needs, we have begun providing a range of services um, to help students and families in this area. Um, the SEL team presented about these initiatives in December, so I'll just provide a brief overview tonight. 
Um, in Oakland, we work from a tiered systems of support model for academic intervention, and we're following that same process for social and emotional learning. Our CSS team interventionists, CST staff, and the, our school social worker, Ms. Barnett, are providing a range of interventions to address SEL skills and mental health needs in Oakland. Um, at the tier one level, which are the services that all students receive, our work includes the SEL curriculum, um, which involve lessons that students participate in uh, weekly and daily check-ins. Um, and we also provide some consultation to families um, to support students' classroom and home-based needs. At the tier two level, more focused support is provided to staff, students, and families via consultation and small group counseling, as well as classroom intervention. And finally, at the tier three level for our most intensive needs, um, services become even more specialized based on whatever um, issues the student is facing. Um, individual counseling and consultation are offered as well as individualized social and emotional interventions in the classroom. Um, Ms. Bolden, Ms. Barnett and I, along with Dr. McDowell and Ms. Coleman support are also in the process of finalizing plans um, to further our SEL efforts via some additional mental health services as well. Thank you, Dr. Whitehouse. Thank you. So what are we proposing as of today? Um, and I want to emphasize as of today because, um, you know, the disclaimer that, that I shared at the beginning of this uh, presentation is that when the guidance changes, so shall we. So as of today, what we're proposing moving forward is to continue to allow the families that have indicated or expressed interest in remaining full remote uh, to stay full remote. Um, this next phase would be to convert our current two day uh, a week students that are in hybrid learning to three day uh, hybrid learners uh, rotating between the gold and the uh, blue cohorts and to convert our current students participating in four days of in-person instruction to five days of in-person instruction and in, in still within that hybrid model. What does that look like? So starting this week, um, families who were participating in full remote were afforded the opportunity to begin receiving in-person instruction. Uh, we know that some families um, may have missed the deadline um, you will hear uh, a little bit about uh, what a next step would be for you a little bit later in this presentation. Effective April 19th, um, our self-contained classrooms will shift from four days to five days of in-person instruction. And on April 26th, our two-day hybrid learners will shift and become three-day hybrid learners rotating between blue and gold cohorts. In addition, our uh, students uh, that have uh, an existing extreme hardship who are currently participating four days a week of in-person instruction would also shift to five days a week of in-person instruction. Uh, and the dates are listed below. We will be um, releasing this presentation as well as giving an, a community uh, uh, update exclusively around school reopening this week. In addition to the calendars uh, for the month of April, so that you will know all of the dates um, that your student uh, can participate in. Phase five, this is status to be determined with the full understanding that as the data uh, comes to us and as the guidance changes uh, within this continuum, we will uh, then be able to make revisions to our plan. Um, as soon as uh, a guidance changes, uh, we will be in short proximity of that seeking to reassess where we are and open up uh, as quickly and safely as possible. For our secondary schools, the dates are similar, but a, but a bit different. Um, phase two would be effective uh, April 19th, shifting remote learners to two-day hybrid learners, um, which coincides with the uh, marking period. Also on April 19th, shifting our four-day uh, self-contained classrooms to five-day self-contained classrooms. And then April 26th, shifting those two-day hybrid learners to three-day hybrid learners, rotating between blue and gold cohorts, and shifting students that have had have demonstrated an extreme hardship um, four days to five days as well, with pullout replacement services taking place on those Wednesdays. Going back to our consideration groups, 
our district has really prided itself on site-based leadership and ultimately flexibility. So uh, the Oakland School has been using targeted data to specifically reach out to the most impacted families in an effort to offer them additional support. In order to maintain the CDC uh, uh, public health guidance, this has been done on a case-by-case -case basis based on enrollment, social distancing, and the severity of family challenge. So although um, every school within our collective school district between Oakland as well as Collingswood looks different, um, their process is also going to look different because every school's level of need varies. So if your family is experiencing an extreme hardship, I would encourage you to please connect with Principal Bolden or Principal uh, uh, Dr. McMullen or uh, Principal Jenna or your counselor for additional information. So I think that when thinking about site-based leadership, it's important to hear from the sites about how they're addressing the needs uh, and the process for you to uh, uh, get additional information. So Principal Bolden. Sure. Um, so this is what we've been doing all year and we will continue to do. We've communicated with our families frequently and we've identified our families that are in particular need. We've been accommodating all of our students with IEPs, INRS or 504 plans by making sure they are receiving the support they need to be successful in either the remote or the in-person classrooms. Uh, delivering academic support through small group sessions before, during, and after school. We've been assisting families experiencing difficult situations at home and connecting, with, connecting them with resources available within our own community. And I would say Mrs. Barnett, our school social worker, um, is taking on this task on our own. She has worked with a ton of families already this year. So if you are in need of anything, please reach out to me and I will connect you with her. Uh, we've been working with unique situations such as learning pods, learning centers, and some unique family situations. Uh, we've implemented the SEL curriculum at all grade levels, and we will continue to offer the weekly meals and provide daily tech support to all of our families. We will now hear from one of the representatives from our middle school. Hi, my name is Caitlin Seeley. I'm the um, main office secretary at Collingswood Middle School. Um, I just wanted to share um, how our process is over at the middle school. The middle school actually has um, the most in returned in-person students currently out of all the Collingswood Elementary High School and the Oakland School District. Um, so we're in a little bit of a unique situation. We do tend to have one of the smaller buildings, much like an elementary school. Um, so we are working within our confines of physical space when allowing students to return. Um, so all current remote students um, are give, have been given the option to return in person um, at the start of every marking period. For the fourth marking period, that would be uh, the due date for that form that was emailed to you if you are a parent of a remote student is this Friday. Um, for planning purposes, we need that by this Friday. Um, we're currently researching procedures to honor all requests for in-person learning and to maintain our health and safety requirements. Um, requests for four-day le in-person learning will be processed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we continue to keep a file as they come in um, and parents will receive a confirmation from CMS or CHS to confirm the status of their request. So when a student returns to in-person learning, we have to make sure we have enough space for them. Um, currently, in the third marking period, we average 143 students hybrid in the blue cohort and 110 students hybrid in the gold cohort. Um, the number of additional students returning in each cohort really determines the amount of availability in the classrooms. When a student returns to in-person learning at the secondary level, it doesn't just affect that one student. It affects every student in every classroom that they enter. Most of the CMS and CHS parents realize that your student has eight different classes with eight different groups of students. And each of those students have eight different classes with eight different students. So it's very much a ripple effect um, as far as uh, space goes. Um, we review each returning student schedule to make sure that they're here, we are adhering to the current CDC guidelines. Um, our first step after collecting the data from our Google form um, is to check the number of students that are wishing to return. Currently, CMS has um, about 50 students coming back for the fourth marking period. As I said, that due date is 
um, Friday. So we expect that to increase. Um, our second step is to assess each class size and to make sure that we don't have any class space room is space issues for health and safety purposes. Um, only after that can I assess whether or not we can allow any other students to come in four days a week. Um, students who fit the predetermined groups as that as we're given at the very beginning of the school year are the first groups eligible to attend four days a week. So that's the POR kids, our um, English language learners, children with IEPs, and then children who have been identified um, by um, INRS and um, other school activities. Our final step is to refer to our four day request file to see if we have any available space for the students whose parents have placed a request. We have recorded every single request that we have gotten that either I have gotten, Dr. McMullen has gotten, or our guidance counselors have gotten. Um, and finally, remember, we really love our students and we want nothing more than to be able to open the doors and have everybody come in. But we have to work within the confines of our physical space and the health and safety guidelines. Everyone in and out of the buildings is working really hard to ensure that the health and safety of our students, we know it is, we know it's hard. We feel it, we live it. Um, and remember that most of your teachers are also fellow parents and they're your neighbors. So thank you for granting us grace and trying to be patient with us. And uh, you know, just know that we're trying to do our best for you as we can. Thank you, Kate. Okay, um, Mr. Jenna. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Matt Jenna. I'm the principal over at Collinswood High School. Um, so our situation at the high school um, is, is different than um, the other schools in the sense that, uh, you know, compared to the middle school or um, all the elementary schools in um, Collinswood and also in Oakland, we have a lower percentage of our students um, currently attending um, in person. We have a higher percentage that are remote. So um, our process now, we, we've been looking to add more um, in-person students for sure, uh, since we feel that we, we have the space to safely do so. Um, so we've been working on that uh, on a number of levels. Um, the first point there, um, our, our whole staff, our administration, counselors, child study team, teachers, um, we have a family liaison um, that works with families, um, our support staff, our secretaries. Um, I've been having discussions uh, and communications surrounding um, reaching out to students that are that are that are struggling with remote learning. We have we do have a a large number of students who are doing very well with it, uh, but we also have some students struggling. So we're reaching out to them directly um, and um, encouraging them to come in for in-person learning. Um, and depending on the situation, that might be two days a week or or four days a week. Um, we've had some success in getting some more students in the building uh, lately. Um, because the second thing that we, we did, the second point there is, um, well, typically we've been waiting to the, the, the beginning of a new marking period to, to bring more in-person students in. Because our numbers of in-person students remain low, uh, we opened up an opportunity for high school families to uh, start, you know, switch from remote to hybrid this week, uh, the week of March 15th. Um, and again, we saw some new faces in the building um, yesterday and today, which, which was nice to see. Um, but we still have more space. We still have more space to, again, to, we feel that we can safely incorporate more students. Um, so similar to the middle school, um, our, our marking period starts at the, our fourth marking period starts at the same time as the middle school. So by March 19th, we've asked high school families to contact me um, if they're interested in um, in-person hybrid learning for the fourth marking period. And right now we have about 30 requests um, and I expect some more to be, uh, to be, be coming in over the next few days um, as well. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to track the numbers. We're going to um, look at um, our overall numbers and, you know, we may be able to offer beyond the two days to some students, you know, up to, up to four or five days, depending on the situation and, and how much space we have available. So we're trying to be as flexible as we can. Uh, we are finding, like I said, many of the students um, at the high school level um, are doing well with the remote learning. Um, they're finding that they can independently um, uh, progress in their classes. Um, however, we are, you know, we're talking to the students that are coming into the building. Um, they are feeling a benefit to it. Um, you know, getting the chance to get back in that routine of getting up, you know, getting ready for school, 
um, getting out of the house. Um, every single one of us over the last year has probably spent more time in our homes than we, we, we would want to. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a sense of isolation at times. Um, so the kids that are coming into the building, even though there's not a, a many, many other uh, of their peers in the building at this time, um, there are some obviously some, some social opportunities with the other kids that are there. Um, and of course our staff are there interacting with them. Um, so the kids are seeing that benefit. Also some students feel that um, it's harder to get work done at home. Um, so when they're coming into the building for in-person classes, they're finding that they can focus on their schoolwork, schoolwork more. Um, so again, we're, we're encouraging uh, the students to take, and parents to take that into consideration. Um, we are more than uh, willing to, to work with families. So um, anybody that has high school age children um, in the audience tonight, uh, I also made this presentation at the Collinswood meeting last night. Um, definitely feel free to contact me at any, at any time and we can discuss for your child um, in-person uh, learning opportunities or whatever you feel works best uh, for your child. Um, throughout the year at the high school, we've also built in some opportunities for, for extra support in different ways for, for, our, for our kids. Um, every afternoon after classes, teach, teachers have office hours. Um, most of the time they're done remotely, but they can also be done in person after classes. Uh, we also have a program where if, if students um, for, for various reasons, whatever the case may be, have accumulated some latenesses or absences throughout the course of the year. We have a program called Late Today, Stay Today. We typically run it in normal year in, in person. We've uh, adopted a, a virtual model for that where essentially um, students log into uh, to, with a teacher and essentially have an afternoon study hall, work on some school work. And while they're there, since it's after school, we're giving them, um, uh, they're making up time, we're giving them attendance credit uh, to make up from some latenesses or absences. So some students are, are, are benefiting from that right now. We also had an opportunity through our uh, Title I funding, our Title I grant at the high school to establish a one-to-one -one or small group tutoring uh, program where we have teachers of various content areas, uh, pretty much any, any content area you can think of, math, science, history, English, whatever the case may be. Uh, different teachers are available to work with students on a one-to-one -one or small group basis um, for some tutoring. And that's happening after hours. So in the late afternoon hours, evening hours, uh, even weekend hours, depending on the teacher's um, availability. Uh, but there's a great degree of flex flexibility with that as well. Um, so again, in summary, um, any high school families, uh, please contact, it, contact me. Uh, we can take a look at the situation and certainly we have the room to offer um, additional in-person in learning opportunities. And we're looking forward to do so, doing so. I think we'll see um, some students that we haven't seen for a while uh, for in-person learning uh, this spring for the fourth market period, which we're excited about. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Jenna. So how, how to engage? Um, we are looking forward to having ongoing discussions with not just staff, but also our, our parents and our caregivers, and then uh, more importantly, our students as well. Um, we are also open to uh, meeting requests from either groups or individuals. Uh, and we will be meeting this week with all of our PTA presidents and, and, and vice presidents in order to request that they host series of community forums uh, for us to be able to all engage and have this level of discussion together. Uh, with the full understanding is that we, we understand that there has been uh, insurmountable loss as a result of COVID. Um, and we have been able to care um, for our students as well as ourselves as a community. And the way that we're going to get to full school reopening is as a community. National dialogue is important, but local concerns and needs have to drive our focus and ultimately the decision-making process. So our goal is to create an equitable and effective teaching and learning environment that utilizes evidence-based policies and practices that will allow us to rethink the way in which school happens for students and teachers in person. So, the question still remains, uh, not a matter of if, but when, um, and our goal is to fully reopen schools for in-person learning. And some of the goals for the reopening would be the establishment of new norms, reestablishing connections between students, staff, and the buildings, uh, as well as preparing for summer learning and then ultimately refining our protocols to ensure that uh, regardless of the strategies uh, for mitigation, we are not uh, contributing to viral spread within our community. 
Uh, and that concludes uh, the um, presentation. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, the, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I guess the, the easiest thing to do is wait until the second uh, discussion period for the uh, public to ask questions about that. Uh, Are we still in the have board minute? members ask questions? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the board can ask questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Jimmy, you want to go first? I, I've got a lot, Denise, if you want to go first. Uh, you might um, Unless you want me to go and then maybe I'll knock some of yours out. Um, so I have two to start. Um, but I wonder if um, Dr. McDowell or Ms. Bolden could talk a little bit about um, the plans for summer schools so far and what that might look like. Um, is it in person? How are students identified? Um, like how big of a program are we talking about? I guess that's just sort of, I wanna understand a little bit more about that. Well, I think I can share with you some of the guiding principles. So the discussions around summer um, were placed on pause because there were just a lot of unanswered questions, but our, our goal, our intent is for summer programming to be delivered in person. Uh, students need to see a different learning environment than what they've experienced during the school year. And if we're truly going to transition students back to full-time in-person instruction, summer um, is an appropriate space for us to um, take some creative steps in terms of enrichment. We have uh, uh, required uh, extended school year through our, for, through our special education department that's separate and apart uh, of the way that we're actually looking at the use of these particular funds. So um, $82,000 is reserved for uh, a, a summer, uh, in addition to our uh, district contribution in Collingswood, which ultimately affects Oakland families who have children at the middle and at the high school. Uh, but then specifically or exclusively at, at the Oakland school, we have 25,000 that's coming in, in addition to uh, local funds to be able to support these programs. I think it's also important to note that um, our strategy needs to also be multiple year. So the funds that we're receiving in terms of the, uh, the stimulus money can be used over multiple years. So the planning that, that is getting ready to move forward, um, which will probably start uh, uh, within the next several weeks, uh, 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 abutting to um, spring break and then continued conversations after spring break with releasing that information sometime in May in terms of programs that will be available. Uh, that work is beginning to start, but we have not made concrete decisions because we still have a lot of unanswered questions and we're seeking to get clarity uh, about what is or what is not allowable with these funds. Perfect, thank you. Um, I have one more question, unrelated. But um, so there's been multiple, um, I guess, talk lately um, and studies that it's looking promising that the guidelines might change from six feet to three feet in terms of social distancing. Obviously, we're not there yet, um, but signs are pointing in that direction. So I'm curious um, if the CDC makes an announcement on Friday how fast are we as a district able to move to that? And I think I'm thinking in terms of facilities, like do we have the, um, the plexiglass for additional deaths, um, you know, that kind of thing in terms of moving the things around, like how quickly are we prepared to, if there is a change to um, pivot and, perhaps invite more people back into the building. Does that make sense? It, it does, it does. And that, that's a very valid question. I, I, and I'm gonna give you um, a nuanced response. So the speed of, of our shift is going to be completely dependent on the new guidance. So for example, if the shift does not include plexiglass dividers, um, that is a faster timeline than if it, if it also includes plexiglass dividers, with the understanding that we will not be the only district in the country ordering these plexiglass dividers. I know that we have a cadre of the dividers currently. Um, so that's, that's some of the nuance around those. But in, in answer to the first part of your question, 
is that we have already begun the process of reassessing our classroom space based on the hint um, indicated in, in some of the national reporting around that three foot uh, social distancing. So that is in process. So uh, in short proximity of, of, of this meeting, we will have uh, new assessed numbers for every classroom within our district. Um, and we will be able to plan accordingly for that. And as soon as the guidance changes and we have an understanding of the full guidance, we'll actually be able to give a timeline. What I would say is, is that if the guidance changed tomorrow, I would not anticipate um, uh, uh, our phase in approach happening prior to spring break. So I think that the natural break uh, would still be spring break. Uh, we would just be increasing overall capacity uh, and, and increasing the number of days based on that new guidance. Thank you. Okay, Jimmy, go ahead. Denise, you knocked off two of my bullets, so <laughs> thank you. That was good. Um, uh, Dr. McDowell, thank you for that presentation. This is my second time I got to watch it. I watched it last night, and it seems uh, you answered a lot of questions that were asked last night um, during the presentation tonight. Um, so it kind of like you honed it a little bit, but um, I'm just going to go through a couple of my notes that I have. Uh, so um, returning to school discussion, I know last month I had mentioned, you know, let's get the survey out, like people are going to start asking questions. And uh, I think this should be the most important and most talked about discussion throughout the board meetings um, until that there's a plan in place that can be followed up with specific goals, assuming that there's no future mishaps or outbreaks. Uh, without clear efforts of this discussion, the community will continue to request more and more information. Um, during your discussion tonight, I, uh, I noticed that I believe there was some confusion, and this might be some confusion with other uh, community members, but I believe in the last two board meetings that Dr. Oswald was with us, he had said we were in the yellow phase. Um, and clearly, I, I mean, you, you showed the slides today, and I looked up on CDC, uh, and that is that is not Correct. Whatever you said earlier, you said like something was in the yellow phase, but we are directly not in the yellow phase. Um, I don't know if you could talk about that for a minute. I can. So um, what you were what what I was referencing was there are two distinctions. Um, the way that the CDC determines your transmission levels is based on county level data. So Camden County um, is three times uh, the transmission rate needed to be in yellow status. So we are actually in red status of 170 uh, cases per 100,000. And in order to actually move out of red status, you have to have less than 100 over a seven day period. Um, the COVID-19 activity level index, often called the Cali report, really highlights the region. So our region consists of Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Salem County. So as a region, uh, when you use that same measure of per 100,000, we are actually in yellow status, but our immediate county is actually uh, in red status. Got it. Understood. Yeah. So I think that might have been some of the confusion for other community members, uh, including myself. Um, so uh, what is the status now and what's preventing us from offering more in-school instructions currently? Um, do we have like low staffing issues or uh, is there any, I mean, is there any issues outside of just the guidelines? Well, we currently, um, and, and Principal Bolden can actually answer this question probably better than I, uh, we have not denied um, any family that has requested for additional in-person instruction. Mm -hmm. um, but we are doing it on a case by case basis with the understanding that our initial goal at the beginning of the year was to make sure that all families were, were given the opportunity for in person instruction. Um, so, Principal Bolden, if you could kind of elaborate um, a bit further on where we fall within that capacity discussion. Yes, we just brought back some additional hybrid students for third marking period, and I'm still getting requests for hybrid students, meaning the two days a week. Right now with the current guidelines in place, we can only fit X number of students per classroom and that number is different based on every classroom and classroom size. So I have to make sure we have the room to accommodate our students who were full remote and want to come back to at least two days a week hybrid before I can start offering empty seats to other families who have requested four days. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, we do have students who are already attending four days 
Um, and that is based on various different factors. It's based on their academic needs. It's based on family hardships. It's also um, based on class size. For example, my fourth grade is so teeny tiny. There's about 20 some students in the entire fourth grade. So if you divide them in half, they could almost all come four days a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some exceptions to the rule. When we have the space, we're going to bring the kids in. I want as many kids back as possible. But in some of my tighter classrooms, we have to first make sure we can accommodate all of the families that could possibly want hybrid. And we ran into a situation earlier this week where a family, a couple families said, oh, I'm, I want to request hybrid. I said, well, we, we had a deadline. And they said, oh, no, the deadline's March 19th. And they were confusing us because we're on trimesters and the middle school, high school is four marking periods. So, you know, we have some kids in Oakland who have siblings at the middle school, siblings at the elementary school, and the families get confused reading the email. So, of course, I don't want any of those families to miss out on coming back for hybrid because we want students to, you know, come back from remote and at least attend two days a week. So we are saving those seats right now. And with the guidelines, it's six feet apart. And that's where we stand. If the guidelines change, we can bump it up. But until that time, we cannot because they're the only seats we have available and we are still waiting for additional plastic barriers to arrive. Um, and then we'll start working our way for the, through the four day a week requests from other families and seeing how many we can accommodate. Great. Yeah. That, I think that was, that, that was our concern was whether or not it was, uh, uh, you, you were not, you didn't have enough staff or if it was something else. So it no, like I, we have full staff. All my, all of my homerooms are covered. We have a teacher in every single homeroom. Um, so we had classrooms that were combined in the beginning of the year. If you remember that the third and the fifth grade were combined because we had such small numbers. We have since divided those classrooms up. So we have our full homerooms in operation and all of the desks set up. We're just waiting to see what students are coming back for hybrid. And then after we have those numbers, we will start inviting additional families back based on the space that we have available. Okay, that's for, great. For, I, I should say inviting additional families back for four days versus the two days. And that's the space becomes available. Yeah, that's great news. You, as you know, my 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 daughters just started yesterday uh, hybrid, and, and they're loving it. It's, yeah. it's so much better. Um, mm -hmm. Another point I have on expanding and reinventing Collinswood and Oakland schools regarding the phase four rotating Wednesdays is going to further stress out families and try to determine the schedule for the kids. Um, I would suggest that we forego the efforts on these Wednesdays and try to focus more on a four day schedule. The Wednesdays, um, I mean, isn't the Wednesdays the cleaning day currently? Like, so if we started bringing kids in on Wednesdays, wouldn't that forego that day of cleaning? And um, parents and children's schedules will be more of a mess than they already are, leaving more stress and harder hardships for families, be it, uh, be it mental health, financial health, or, or whatever, um, going on back and forth Wednesdays. Keith, can you, um, are you still on the call? Keith? Yes, sir. Can you answer that uh, that cleaning question, please? Yep. Uh, the logistics of the uh, extra cleaning should not be an issue. Uh, we are currently, uh, the four days a week that we have hybrid instruction, we are going around every 30 minutes and spraying all of the touch points and cleaning the bathrooms. Uh, it would mean that uh, we would lose a day of uh, wiping everything down top to bottom on Wednesdays, but I feel that could be uh, accommodated at night, uh, given uh, the custodians are pretty much wiping just about everything down. We've been utilizing Wednesdays at this point uh, to try to get project work done that would normally interrupt the kids where we're drilling, sawing, banging, making dust. So I do not foresee it being an issue with uh, getting the cleaning done the way it needs to be done. Okay. So Jim, in answer to the second part of your question, Dr. Whitehouse, could you explain um, the concept around Wednesdays, specifically around the pullout replacement services? She might have left the call, but I can answer that question okay. as well. All of our um, pullout replacement resource students are in our blue and gold hybrid teams attending four days a week. So bringing staff and students back on Wednesday, will then get our pullout replacement students back five days a week, every week. So we really wanna step up that, that um, support for our special ed students. Um, in addition, um, we've had families pushing for more time. So this is another way to just offer some of the students more time. 
I do want to mention that if it does not work for your family, you are still welcome to stay home on that Wednesday and participate in remote instruction. We're not going to force anybody to come in on that Wednesday, but there were a lot of families that were very excited hearing that they're going to get an extra day at least every other week where their child can attend in-person schooling. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make that like evident that was it. There you are. Yeah, sorry. Um, so pull out replacement is partially dependent on the gen ed schedule because mm-hmm. those students spend some time in the general ed classroom. So it gets a little complicated trying to schedule adding their pull out replacement time if their gen ed classroom isn't available. So since we're now coming in on those Wednesdays, it makes it a lot easier to schedule and um, students could come in for pull out replacement still, but then they miss time when they're traveling back and forth if their um, gen ed classroom isn't open. So Okay. Can I just ask a clarifying question before we move on from that? So is that, so is it, if I were to drill this down, it would be, we're not able right now to accommodate four days, all students, all gen ed students, I should say. We have been successful in the two day hybrid, 50%, 50%, all remote, and we're Adding, the plan is to add in additional, the additional time that we can at this time, based on the guidelines, add in is an additional Wednesday every other week per cohort. Am I understanding that correctly? I just wanted yes. to, there's yes. just been a lot of numbers thrown around. So I wanted to make sure I was understanding that. That's correct. Okay, I have two more things and then I'll, I'll let the meeting go. Sorry, uh, sorry for taking up so much time. But I feel like this might might uh, answer some of the community's questions too. Um, so uh, I feel like there's a clear difference between elementary and secondary needs uh, with their abilities and schedules. Uh, elementary learning is critical for academic and social growth at their ages. Uh, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, uh, elementary, school, elementary students do not move back and forth from classroom as frequently as secondary schools. So I understand the logistic problem of, you know, high school moving into eight different classrooms throughout the day and then the potential uh, contamination of the air supply throughout the hallways and everything else. But elementary schools are typically, you know, they're in the same classroom the entire time. Um, Social aspects of elementary uh, to prevent future anxiety issues. um, That's something I'm personally concerned of is, uh, you know, having, a year of self-isolation for a six-year-old and, a, and a eight-year-old, um, it you know could could lead to some future anxiety problems without having uh, to be able to to meet up with their friends and hang out in schools. Um, and finally, I can't speak for high school, but I assume that they're more comfortable with remote learning, and the need for parents to play a critical role isn't as much of a factor for younger students. Um, so you know, I've basically had to. And I mean, not just me, but I know a lot of parents have had to pretty much quit their jobs um, uh, and just or or do as little work as possible to keep keep the kids going. Um, I think, you know, uh, high school kids, say they're 15, 16, 17, they could probably stay at home by themselves while their parents work. Um, So that's another thing. So that's just, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't really need to comment back on that, but uh, my final and maybe most important thing uh, of this is uh, is a question and I would like some type of feedback, but I've heard over, over a few days that there's been a super sub, like a uh, shortage of substitute teachers in New Jersey or maybe nationwide. I don't, I don't know if it is, uh, but I also remember seeing somewhere on a note that their wage was $15 an hour. Um, I saw that on minutes, like I think last month. And if that's true, that is only 12 cents or 11 cents more than a living wage in New Jersey or in Camden County specifically. Um, and according to the unemployment rate, rate, there's a lot of people out there looking for jobs. And if we're giving substitute teachers $15 an hour, that's, that's a very clear reason why there's a shortage of substitute teachers. Um, I don't know if I saw that on board minutes or on the budget maybe last month, I believe. And uh, so I don't know if that's true, but if that is, I think we should try to figure out how to increase that number. Um, Because if, if, you know, if you could be a Walmart greeter for 15 bucks an hour or have to tolerate uh, working in a COVID environment with children, teaching, you know, teaching uh, a subject that you're not familiar with, uh, I would, I would probably greet at Walmart. Mrs. Coleman, can you answer that question, please? 
I was taking notes at the same time. Uh, we can certainly discuss it during the Finance Buildings and Grounds Committee. I do know we we did increase the rate for subs. Um, if it wasn't last year, it was the year before. So we have been gradually increasing the rate of pay for subs as well as the rate of pay for nursing subs. Um, so we can certainly take a look at that and um, discuss it in Finance Buildings and Grounds. And we can- What is, what is the daily- uh Great for subs. I saw something yesterday, whatever it was, a hundred dollars a day, or you know what it is. I believe it's ninety, ninety-five dollars a day, depending if they're certified. If they're certified. Yeah. Yeah, that to me, that to me seems very crazy, especially given our environment that we're in. But uh, but that's all I have. So I uh, thank you for your time. So I'll uh, we can move on. Out a, a couple quick questions if I could jump in. Um, uh, just to kind of piggyback off of uh, what Mrs. Bolden had, had said uh, in regards to uh, social distancing and the capacity in each classroom. And this may be something that, that was covered more explicitly during uh, buildings, uh, finance, buildings, and grounds uh, committees. But I, I wonder if the community would benefit from actually seeing. Uh, a, a breakdown of, of, you know, each classroom, you know, here's our square footage in our first grade, particular first grade classroom based on six feet. This is how many students we could fit based on three feet. This is how many students we could fit. And then to actually, you know, be able to see the, the what that looks like in terms of the numbers as we start to bring students back. Um, yeah, I think it would be helpful for everybody to kind of visualize uh, what we're dealing with facilities wise and in terms of the size of the classrooms, um and and the number of students that we're servicing um you know and the other piece too um that again i think folks may benefit from too um is you know having the opportunity to and, and miss bolden you may be able to answer this off the top of your head um see uh you know what the breadth of the school day looks like at this point um and as we're coming back so uh you, you know are the expected hours uh you know Four, four hours a day, here's how it's broken down um, uh, over the course of the day so the parents can, uh, you know, help monitor uh, and support their kids um, as they're transitioning through through their different classes and things. So I'll, 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 so we'll Jen, get a schedule I'll, out. I'll actually start. I think that, so the, the, the first, Richard, first part of your question is that um, we um, will not be uh, providing publicly the breakdown of classroom capacity, and here's why. Um, there are diverse needs that are present in each and every classroom. Mm -hmm. So the nuance, uh, which would ultimately identify uh, students, we believe is a violation of student privacy. Mm -hmm. So in terms of that, that level of, of breakdown, we won't be sharing with that, not in a public space. That would be reserved for board members. So we could share that with board members who are, uh, uh, are, conf are confidential in nature. I think that um, the flexibilities uh, that, that come or the factors that go into the decision-making process are going to be different from school to school. And what we're not trying to create is uh, an environment to argue the capacity of each and every classroom. And I think that because there are uh, circumstances that drives the capacity of each and every classroom based on the personalized needs of each and every student. So, I think that from a board perspective, absolutely, we can share with you everything uh, so that you understand and, and, and can rest assured that we are maximizing our space and our capacity uh, to be able to bring back as many students as possible. Um, in terms of the second question, I'm gonna hand that over to Principal Bolt. Yeah, um, we are revising the schedule, as I said, and as soon as we have those schedules in place, each homeroom teacher will have a schedule that they should be posting on their Google Classroom. I mean, their schedules right now should be posted on their Google Classroom. And when we revise it, they will also post those schedules on Google Classroom. So you could see the breakdown of time spent each day in the language arts area and the math area. And like I said, we'll be shifting the social studies and science to that Wednesday because that is the shorter day and we'll make it a more academic day and focus on social studies and science so that we can spend more of the language arts and math um, time on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and Believe me, as Dr. McDowell stated, we are trying to maximize space. I have even moved classrooms around um, to create additional space within the classroom so we could bring back more kids. So the teachers, you know, had to had to uproot and move 
right at the end of the year, just so we could create more space. And we're willing to do that to maximize our space. Rich, there's a there's another portion of your original question around the the breadth of, of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when, that's... The, when the guidance changes um, in terms of length of day, we're also going to be looking at that as well. Mm -hmm. Our goal, our long term goal, um, is to get to full day in person instruction. So if we uh, if we see an opening and we have the capacity to not just add additional days but also add um, additional time, uh, we, we will do so. Um, but it really is heavily dependent on the new guidance that we know will probably be here either the end of this week or beginning of the next. Yeah, and, and I just to piggyback off of that, I, I think too, uh, you know, for the community to realize what a significant uh, hurdle uh, that that part is in terms of feeding the students um, and, and, and what the requirements are uh, for that. You can't eat with a mask on. So that kind of changes a lot of things. So, uh, you know, that that's a pretty significant hurdle um, that I, I think a lot of districts are, are, are I, don't, I don't know if we have an answer yet for, for that piece. I have an additional question. I'm sorry, I don't want to jump in front of another board member has a question. But um, uh, Principal Jenna had mentioned at the high school that they are um, uh, offering in person office hours if needed for some students. And I was just wondering if that's something that can be or is already offered here, um, if there's a particular need. I know that obviously it, it's offered remotely. I was just curious about the in-person aspect of that as well. Would you like me to answer that? Yes, please. Oh, um, the in-person office hours will become available when all of the staff are back in until three o'clock. So what we plan to use that time for is maybe additional academic support and some interventions through our INRS team during those office hour times. So if the students could get back up to school for one of those small group or one-to-one -one sessions, that would be awesome. If not, we will continue to do it remotely. But yes, we can increase um, more in-person office hour time. That's Perfect. great news. Thank you. Um, and one more, um, I don't think this was in the presentation, so forgive me if it's not related, but I recall seeing something in the newsletter and I can't remember the details about a different um, start time or arrival time. I can't remember if it was Wednesdays, but wondering if you can clarify um, what that is. Thank you. Would you like me to answer the arrival? Yeah, discussion I'm, I'm, we had. I'm, yes, please. I'm pulling it up just so that sure. I'm referencing um, uh, Denise's question. What we would like to do is to start our arrival time a little bit later because right now we have a half hour window and we're finding that it's not really taking the whole half hour to get the kids in. So we would like to cut that down and start at 8.45. So we would arri arrival would be 8.45 instead of 8.30, 8.45 to nine o'clock. What that would do was would also open up hours in the morning where some teachers, academic support and INRS specialists could meet with kids again instead of doing door duty at 8.30. They would have those additional minutes to meet with students. And on Wednesdays when we're in person, the dismissal time is 12 o'clock versus one o'clock because Wednesday is the only day that the staff have to get together as grade levels and do the car model process for planning and um, you know, mapping out their next week's lesson plans. Perfect. Thank you so much. That answers. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, I just wanted to um, kind of chime in for a little bit too, just share some thoughts, um, I think with the board and, and with our community as well. Um, really don't have a question to the very end, so so bear with me, but, um, you know, this is a great opportunity for us as a board as, you know, to be transparent with the community uh, and to know that, you know, this is the first time collectively we've been able to, I think, share our ideas, our thoughts, uh, our concerns. We've done so in committee, but, you know, this has been, been our first opportunity to, uh, I think, get a better understanding of where we are coming from individually as a board. Uh, and I think, you know, the community, will, you know, wants to know what our feel and what our sense is, too. Um, so with that said, I, you know, just have some thoughts that I'd like to share. I realize uh, they may not be representative of the entire board, kind of just my views on the matter. Um, and, you know, to a point that Dr. McDowell made earlier that 
we may have some disagreements on the process, but we're all hoping for the same thing. Um, there's a, a, a quote as a history teacher I love to use from Thomas Jefferson, where he said every uh, a difference of opinion is not necessarily a difference of principle. Um, and I kind of, I've always been proud that I think we operate that way as a board. Um, so first, a big thank you, I want to say to the parents. Um, you know, I was, I was privy last night when I zoomed into the Collingswood board meeting um, to hear a lot of thanks and, and gratitude to, to the teachers. And being a social studies teacher at CMS, that was very encouraging, but I, I feel that thank you goes right back to the parents uh, and everything they've done uh, and what they've uh, had to deal with it and every hardship they've encountered. Um, so thank you to our parents. Um, I understand your frustration. Um, I understand the uh, urgency that many of advocate for and would feel comfortable not adhering to a six foot guideline if that still remained uh, and adhering to a three foot guideline. Um, there is science to, to back that up. The Journal of Clinical um, Infectious Diseases did a study in Massachusetts where they said that we could reduce the distance assuming masks were still worn. Um, even Dr. Fauci, who in my own humble opinion has done more harm to our school children than the literary works of Dr. Seuss um, has kind of stepped back with the uh, six feet social distancing. Um, and I think with this incremental approach, we're gonna to begin to ease some of the concerns that our students have, that our parents have, that our community members have. Um, and it's my hope that we can see this incremental increase in the spring. Um, and I think as more students come back, it'll be a ripple effect. I think they'll see more incentive in returning. I think they'll see an improvement in the quality of instruction as well. Um, and for me, then that leads us to kind of what I consider the eyes on the prize, and that's September. Um, I know we said we will open fully. It's not a matter of if, but when. Personally, I feel that when needs to be September. Um, Cup September, I want to see us open fully. Um, I want to see our kids back in school full time. Um, back to the old normal. I know there's been a lot of discussion about this is the new normal. Um, I want our kids coming in uh, and kind of experiencing school as they, they knew it. Um, you know, I think it's important that we have a contingency plan in place. We've always been, I think, very effective as a district, Collinsburg and Oakland, being able to pivot at a moment's notice. Um, I applauded our efforts last year when we had a transition to remote. I think we were head and shoulders in Oakland and Collinswood. Uh, far above surrounding districts in making that transition. Uh, we proved we can do it successfully and I think if need be, we can, we can do it again. Uh, but I would, like, I would like to see our plan of kind of being able to answer the question of when, for me, when being um, full in-person instruction open to full capacity uh, come September. And if that means not so much having a rigid adherence to the guidelines personally, um, I'm okay with that. And that's what I would want to advocate. Um, my last point, and kind of this is going to lead to a question, and I feel it's important that we all know. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not the virtual option uh, will still be mandated by the governor. I believe, I could be incorrect, but I believe through an executive order, Governor Murphy had basically required every district to offer um, a virtual option. Um, and Will that virtual option still be mandated, so to speak, come September? Uh, and if it is, what are the guidelines? Is it left to the districts to determine uh, the extent of that virtual option? Uh, what would the requirements be to qualify for virtual? Um, I believe in Pennsylvania, they kind of take a regional approach uh, with the remote learning. Um, so there are some questions there because if that virtual option is still on the table, um, that changes things, I think, drastically for what we would like to see moving forward. So I would need just a little more um, clarification and direction on that if the virtual um, kind of option remains. So 
Um, I just want to share my thoughts. I, I feel we owe it to each other as a board to kind of know what our thoughts are, where we're coming from, for the public to hear that. Um, again, I know that may not be the consensus of, of my fellow colleagues on the board, uh, but I just want to share kind of that's my thought, my direction, my hope moving forward. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the time and I appreciate the discussions we've had uh, and the feedback we've been able to share so far. So thank, so thank, you, for, thank you for sharing. So just so that I'm clear, um, what we are planning for as a district is full-time in-person instruction in September. That's what we're planning for or sooner. So I think that, you know, that's that caveat and provided there are no major hiccups in terms of, of, of transmission or anything like that, um, that should be our, North, our Northern Star. That's what we're shooting for. In terms of um, the adherence to the guidance, um, there is consensus among um, our district leaders, our school leaders, all four of our association leadership teams, as well as the majority of their members um, to follow the standard that has uh, kept us in an environment with low to no viral transmission. So I think that one of the things that we have done as a result of that consensus is um, we have been approached by a group of medical and public health professionals so that we get a second opinion above and beyond what's happening within the Camden County Office of Public Health. They are comprised of board certified pediatricians, pediatric nurses with expertise in public health training, uh, pediatric mental health counselors, and then um, multiple experts in community and public health. They have agreed to participate alongside our association leaders, as well as some of our district and school leaders, as well as board members, um, which would include some of you on this board to be able to wrestle with and then identify striking that balance with how we should be interpreting the guidance moving forward based on science that may not be made publicly available. Uh, so that, uh, that has emerged as of this week. Um, so we will be having further conversations about uh, bringing that group more into prominence as uh, public health officials that we go to to be able to be more discerning. Just to uh, piggyback off of Todd real quick, um, you know, one of one of the things that's come up uh, as well um, th throughout the community is uh, the amount of uh, screen time that that's that students uh, have uh, when they are on site. Um, and and Todd, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I know. Uh, firsthand how, how challenging it has been for the teachers uh, to uh, maintain these, these simulcasting type of routines um, and, and to balance uh, the, the needs and engagement of students who are in the buildings and the students who are remote. Um, it's not easy. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great challenge. Um, so while students may be utilizing uh, uh, laptops and things, you, you know, while they're in the building, um, due to curricular components that are now digital out, out of necessity, um, uh, you know, I don't know that it necessarily means that students are uh, just learning via Zoom at, at, at a distance from their classroom teacher, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a credible, an incredible balancing act, and, uh, you know, I think something that, that the teachers all deserve a pat on the back for, um, and I don't, I don't think people know how challenging it is. I, I came across a quote uh, on Twitter that, that said, you know, the teachers right now are uh, building the plane as they're flying it, um, and that's that's basically what's happening. So, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Mrs. Bolden or, or, or Todd, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, to, to speak to, to, to some of the challenges with that, some of the successes, um, and, and, you know, maybe what that looks like in the trenches a little bit, again, just to kind of put the community at ease um, in, in terms of what that face-to-face -face time looks like. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that, Rich. That, that, that's a great point. Um, you know, it, it's, I feel right now that the kids kind of coming in to the classroom, those few that are coming in in a hybrid group, um, it's difficult for them in the sense that they're experiencing no difference coming in and learning or if they sat at home, um, because the majority of the students are hybrid, um, you know, maybe in a given class, I may have three students physically in the classroom. I've got 20 some on my screen. 
Um, so as a teacher, most of our time, our attention is locked in on the screen. Um, locked on a screen that you're basically looking at 20 icons because cameras aren't turned on either. Um, so there's, I know there's a frustration in students that I've talked to um, where they're getting to a point where they've been very open and honest and say, I don't see the point in coming in right now. Um, there's no clear benefit, no clear advantage to a student coming in given the current conditions and, and circumstances. Um, I think once that benefit uh, and advantage becomes clearer to the students, when things begin to change, it will kind of be a ripple effect. More students are gonna to wanna to come in, they're gonna realize more of my friends are going in. Um, you know, We're having phys ed like we normally do. Uh, we're having kind of organic classroom discussions like we normally do. Um, so I hope to, to see that change, but it, it, is, it is a challenge. Uh, and I don't feel, I mean, we're trying to serve both groups as best we can mm -hmm. uh, as teachers in the classroom, but um, I don't feel we are serving the kids coming in as well as we could be because so much of our attention and focus is dedicated to uh, the students on the screen. I'm gonna have to say, Todd, I see that happening at the middle school, high school, but that does look a little different at the elementary level specifically. Sure. Um, if you walk into any of our preschool, kindergarten, and first grade rooms, they, they don't look much different than what they had looked in the past. Those students are not bringing their devices to school. So when the teacher is Zooming, she has the computer kind of off to the side and the kids can see their peers on the screen, but she's interacting with the students face to face. They're doing some partner reading from six feet distance, you know helping, working with each other. I was in a kindergarten classroom the other day and I was just amazed at how well the teacher was able to balance um, having the kids sitting on the floors reading and checking in with each one on their individual readers while she's jumping back to the screen and working with those kids. Um, so in the pre-K KM1, um, they're doing a great job and those kids are getting a great experience in person. Uh, second through fifth, they're also able to at least participate in small group discussions. They have snack time where they get to talk with their friends. They're going and doing recess. Um, so although they're spending a little bit more time on the Chromebooks, uh, because our numbers are smaller at the upper grades as well with the kids coming into the building and we do still have a, we had a larger number of remote students um, that they did spend time doing some work on the Chromebooks, but there was still a decent amount of teacher-student interaction and student-student interaction um, in the elementary setting. But that is quite different um, from middle school, high school, but um, you know, they're doing the best they can and, and it's not too terrible. The kids are, I went into a classroom today in, in fourth grade and some of the kids said, Ms. Bolden, we're so happy to be back. This is so much fun. You know, so that, that speaks volumes. You know what I mean? I was happy to see their faces. They just started this week. Uh, I'm happy to hear that, Jen. Thanks for sharing that. That's good news there. I just wanted to raise that, I mean, based on the survey in August and the survey that just went out a couple of weeks ago, the vast majority of people, of families want synchronous learning. So, and, but then I'm also hearing a lot of my kids in front of a screen too much, which I've got three kids in front of three screens all day long. I understand. Where is there a solution there? How do we, how can you give, how can we be equitable in our education of all kids, which is the, the only goal, right? And how can we get the kids at home or the kids in school off screens and be synchronous, which is also what everyone wants? Is there a creative solution to that? Or is this the absolute best thing that we can do at this time with the circumstances that we have? We're currently in the process um, being led by leaders like Principal Bolden, our Chief Academic Officer, Jen McPartland, um, our academic support teachers, and some of our classroom teachers uh, at multiple schools of reevaluating and revising the daily schedule to, to create a better balance between um, direct interaction between uh, uh, students and the teachers as w and, and trying to balance um, uh, screen time. So we, we are uh, actively um, for the last several weeks have been looking at that and engaging in those discussions based on the feedback that we've gotten from our community. Um, and we will be releasing a, a, an altered schedule very, very soon. Thank you for that. Chris Riley has her hands up. 
Chris, you're, you're muted. Given the fact that um, everything depends on space according to the guidelines by the CDC and whatever, is it possible to give the parents an idea of what it looks like with the number of spaces we have now with six foot distancing, how many students, if they all wanted to come back, could we actually physically take care of? And then come September or in the beginning of May, if it goes to three feet distancing, uh, how many students we could take care of? Because I think there is this, uh, this understa a misunderstanding that we are holding this whole process back. And we're not, we're just trying to keep everybody safe. I mean, September of 2019, we had 100% students in the building. Uh, September in 2020, totally different. You know what I mean? So, and I'm wondering if those kind of facts and figures would help some of the parents understand that, you know, at six foot distancing, no matter what happens, this is all the students we can we met we can stick anywhere even in a closet in in the elementary school go to three feet we can accommodate more and back to what todd was saying another point i'm not so sure we won't have to keep some type of um uh, remote learning because we have students that are medically fragile and until they probably feel very confident that um, they have control of this. I doubt that those parents would be willing to send their students back to school mm -hmm. under any circumstances. So um, I'm hoping that perhaps we could address these two things, the uh, not so much for, for September with the students coming back uh, with medical issues, but possibly laying this out to the parents like, you know, we're not holding your kids back. We just can't do it right now. So in, in answer to that to that question, in terms of capacity, we're currently um, we're currently reevaluating and and reassessing what classroom spaces look like with the three foot mm -hmm. uh, guidance um, right. in preparation for when that guidance does come down. So we're currently mm -hmm. actively making uh, those steps right now. Mm -hmm. In terms yeah. of the executive order for uh, remote learning, um, we have had no discussions about that executive order being removed. And dependent, so all, all of these decisions are really dependent on the continuum of the virus. They're also dependent on vaccination mm -hmm. rates, whether or not we hit those state and, uh, uh, and local targets for vaccination in, in terms of uh, what's been articulated at the national level. And then ultimately uh, uh, viral transmission rates. So as viral transmission rates go down, as more um, uh, residents get vaccinated, as mm -hmm. the guidance changes, this is a constant um, ebb and flow, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ebb and flow, where we are on a weekly basis having to rethink the plan that we had the week prior. So right. I think that um, the feedback, at least what we've been able to glean on our, in our weekly meetings, is that remote um, will probably, uh, or highly, it is highly likely that remote learning will still be an option for families. But the mm -hmm. guidance to how families actually access that as, as an option has yet to be uh, revised. Right. So we, we have to operate under the assumption that there will be some form of remote yep. learning. Mm -hmm. And this presents a logistical challenge if the overwhelming majority of students are there in person. So from yeah. an equitable perspective, we, we have to also take that into consideration. Yeah, because I'm thinking... I mean, I've been in the middle school. I know how tight those classrooms are when the students are there and the desks are butted up one against the other. Um, I just wondered you know, if the, some of the parents really realize that um, it would, it's going to take almost a total relaxation of social distancing before we could possibly bring back all of the students that should be back in the middle school. And I think there's some frustration as, you know, why aren't you bringing them back and disregard this or that? But we really don't have the physical space to bring the back under the guidelines, even if we wanted to. Well, what we're doing at the middle school level is we are now thinking creatively. So we're looking at non-traditional spaces that mm -hmm. could have increased capacity. So just as Principal Bolden talked about, you know, uh, moving, cl moving classrooms based on enrollment patterns, we're right. looking at some of those same things at the middle school. Mm -hmm. We're also thinking about how do we better leverage and use the facility that we have with the understanding mm -hmm. that you don't, we don't, we don't have additional space, 
right. where we can better utilize the, the yeah. existing space. So that's yeah. currently also in process. Yeah, I totally agree with taking caution and following um, the CDC guidelines and moving along as we can. My only pushback has come from people that has said to me, they, I just get the impression they just don't understand what it's like when we get these um, issues pay, face, facing us and we cannot meet what the parents want as opposed to the, uh, what we would like to have full school, you know, from nine to three, because they don't seem to understand that, how do you deal with lunch? How do you deal with the social distancing when you have a building that has only so many square feet in it? And uh, that's why I was wondering if, you know, telling them that you know, at, with, um, three feet distancing, we can only fit X number of our students back in that building um, in, the, in the elementary school full time from nine from, from nine to one, uh, only 60% would be able to move back. You know what I mean? Because I think they've got this notion that once this all gets dropped down that everybody to three feet, everybody's going to be able to come back into the building, whether they and we'll, we'll go back to what it was. And I don't think we're going to be there. Can I hop on this train really quick? Um, sure. I think it's from, I think it started with the Reese and then went to Todd and then went to Chris um, and I might be backtracking a little bit. Um, but according to those charts um, and the survey, it looked like 5% of Oakland elementary wanted uh, remote only. Um, right. So let's fast forward when we can actually open up the schools completely and mm -hmm. those 5% still want remote only can we co Jim, let me, let me, let me, Jim let me interject before you, you fin finish that question five percent indicated um, remote only but 28.6 percent indicated that they were fine either remote or in person right yeah that's fine let's, well, yeah okay. let's just that's what I'm saying let's let's assume mm -hmm. that those the right. other 24 percent said they're going to go back to school so we're left with the five percent that that are going to go remote only can we commingle Collinswood and uh, Collinswood Elementaries and Oakland Elementaries segregate one of the best virtual teachers to teach that 5% of Collinswood or, or that 5% of Oakland and whatever the percentage is of, uh, of Collinswood as well, um, basically combining Oakland students with Collinswood students on a virtual level. Is that something that could be possible? Well, that in theory is a great idea. I think that there are um, there are some structural challenges associated with that. Um, yeah. I know that in my previous district, um, we were a, a much larger district. And what we had was we had actually parsed out a virtual academy that had specific teachers and they taught students district wide, but they were all within the same district. I think that the, the logistical challenge that we would need to work through, not to say that we can't work through it, would be um, how do you support children from two different districts with a staff member from another district? So I think that we would we we would have to we'd have to work out you know some type of arrangement and at least we're open to exploring what that might look like, but we won't know what that level of demand is until we have a more robust uh, data collection that really identifies if that is the new normal for September who still wants to participate with it within that space. I don't know if the numbers will still fall then with a, with a different continuum right. versus what happened um, in when we surveyed at the beginning of March. Yeah. I think it, it might be a, a, you know, might be a significant idea to romance because having, having a teacher, um, you know, let's say they have 25 students and one of them is remote having to, you know, present the whole class in that remote session for that one student is, is just, uh, it's not going to be easy for anyone um, right. when, when they could just, you know, if we could just consolidate all the remote into one uh, per grade. But yeah, it's just something I just thought of. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, is there a motion to come out of the Committee of the Whole, please? So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're back in uh, a regular session at this point. We'll go to section nine uh, with the liaison reports. Denise, you're first up. 
All right, so I'm gonna give the PTA report. So the PTA met um, last week on March the 9th. Um, our big news is the virtual talent show that the PTA hosted last Friday. Um, I sent all the board members the recording of it. Um, I hope you had a chance to watch it and enjoy it. It was really a fun night. Um, really thankful to all of the committee members that worked on that, as well as all the students and their parents um, that um, sent in such wonderfully um, creative ideas. Um, my family had a lot of fun watching it. Um, and the PTA was able to raise um, over $1,000 in donations, um, which was wonderful. Like it was, you know, a low expense production. And um, we, you know, turned it into a fundraiser, which was excellent. Um, and 138 households um, tuned into it. So it was really fun. The PTA is also working on um, fifth grade promotion, um, looking at what that would look like if there's a outdoor ceremony um, and maybe even a pool party. So that's fun. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we are also looking ahead to Teacher Appreciation Week. And um, so I just wanted to bring up a point there. Um, we did uh, have a couple teachers on um, in the PTA meeting last week, which was wonderful. So we kind of picked their brains about um, what teachers might appreciate uh, for Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, and I should rephrase, Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week. Um, and one of the things we learned is um, teachers are still spending their own money on uh, materials for the classroom. Like this is, you know, it's just who they are. They're so selfless. They just, you know, the first thing they ask for is like something for the students. And um, we'd really love to do something for them. But I wanted to put it out to a reminder, particularly if there are um, teachers on uh, the Zoom tonight, that the PTA does have grants. Um, I believe it's up to $100. I, I have to double check the amount. But um, we would love to reimburse teachers for some of the money that they're spending on um, additional online resources. Some of the teachers were um, buying manipulatives or books for their classroom. Um, and so um, please reach out to the PTA. It's a simple grant application, but we have money. And we would really love to reimburse the teachers for the money that they're putting out. Uh, we also have another fundraiser going on with Charleston Rep. And there will also be um, elections coming up for the PTA. So there, the president as well as the membership secretary um, will be up for re-election. So uh, if anyone is interested in running for office for the PTA, um, please reach out. We would love to have you. And um, that's it. Our next meeting will be uh, via Zoom on April 13th. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Denise. Anybody have any questions for her? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to OMESAC. Therese. Hi, so the OMESAC, the OMESAC board did not meet uh, in February, but um, right now they're waiting to hear the budget process for um, 21 to 2022, and um, they're going to be having a meeting soon uh, about scholarships. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to me. The Collinswood meeting. Uh, most of you guys probably listened in on this last night, so I'll, I'll go fairly quickly. Uh, there was a budget presentation as was done for Oakland tonight. Uh, there's the school reopening plan as was done for Oakland tonight. Uh, there was a very lengthy public comment section uh, that went on uh, what seemed like forever. It wasn't. Uh, they signed or they uh, uh, approved a preschool uh, contract with Oakland. Uh, they uh, psych evaluations. They approved a Spanish speaker uh, to help with that, with that area. Uh, Our Lady of Lourdes uh, nursing students uh, were approved to uh, work with Collingswood. Uh, and I guess it's their senior year, uh, and they've done that for a number of years now. That that's not uh, anything new. Uh, they uh, approved a 
requested uh, support document for uh, SEL. Uh, they approved uh, middle school and high school spring sports uh, uh, fees for, or not fees, but uh, payment for the individuals that uh, referee and coach and whatnot. And they approved uh, on the first reading a number of policies. Uh, they now have a policy committee that uh, reviews these things and they went through probably 12 to 15 policies. Uh, some of them they held, others were uh, approved for first reading. And uh, that was about it. So any questions on anything? I'll happy to try and answer them for you. None, great. Uh, okay, the Oakland Educational Foundation. Uh, Teresa, you're back on. Hi, so the OEF board met on March 1st. They had a successful Gertrude Hawks spring candy sale. Um, the orders are being processed now with an estimated profit of $660. Um, the OEF Student Technology Fund is still accepting donations and as of this moment um, has raised $9,706. Um, and they also will be having scholarship meetings coming up. And that's it. Hey, Theresa, I have a question about that. Did um, I think I asked last month, uh, did you guys um, start soliciting like local businesses or anything for those donations? Oh, forgive me. Um, Are you volunteering? Adam, yeah. No, <laughs> no I, unfortunately, um, I was not able to attend the board meeting this month, but um, Maybe Adam, I know Adam is I on. I chime in. Or, oh, sorry. Denise, I'm sorry, please. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, we have not yet. Um, there were, there was some discussion about, um, you know, dine and donates and that sort of thing, but um, we just tabled everything uh, for now until um, the environment changes a bit. Um, but, oh, and Adam said we talked about writing letters to businesses. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for my letter. I'll have a yeah. Oh, don't you worry. As a fundraiser, I'll, I'll draft one. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be the Sorry. first one, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, question for you on the, the computer repair uh, fund uh, that you're running there. Uh, you, you've got $9,700 in. Uh, do you know how much you've paid out, if any? We are waiting. We are waiting for someone to tell us who to write a check to and for how much. Okay. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done that yet. We um once I we get close to the end of the school year or even the summer because we like to keep items in stock for break and fix and extra Chromebooks. Um, the CARES money helped quite a bit. So uh, over the summer, when we start getting our orders back in, that's most likely what I'm going to reach out to Adam. And nothing stops Beth Ann from asking for it two years from now. It will be in the reserve for her to spend on technology and it will not expire. And I know how to reach Adam, so it's good. <laughs> and it will hopefully grow. <laughs> okay, Jimmy, I hope that's not quite right. Uh, okay, uh, we'll move on then to section 10. Uh, but then uh, you're on. Okay, this evening um, I have your February 2021 monthly transfer report for approval. Your 2000, your February, excuse me, 2021 Secretary Treasurer's report and financial statements for approval. Um, a listing of your March 2021 purchase orders that have been issued, and a listing of the uh, March 2021 warrants uh, to be paid tomorrow morning. So. These items correspond to um, items 11.02 through 11.06 um, in Teresa's report. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. And with that, uh, we go back to you once again, Teresa. <laughs> Hi. Um, so for your approval, um, as Mrs. Coleman had detailed uh, points 11. One through 11.06 um, are based on all of her reports. Um, 07 is a resolution urging relief from e increased costs to school districts resulting from. Uh, is my sound okay? Sorry, I was getting feedback. No. Sorry okay about that. 
um, from the implementation of Chapter 44 in the 2020 School Employee Health Benefits Reform Law. Um, 11.08 is the recommendation on um, to work with um, Hardenberg Insurance Group, um, our risk management consultant. 11.09 is the revised shared preschool contract with Collingswood that was approved by their board last night. 11.10 is uh, the submission of the Oakland preschool budget to the New Jersey DOE. 11.11 .11 is the submission of the 2021-2022 budget to New Jersey DOE as outlined by Mrs. Coleman tonight. 11.12 is a resolution um, to the U.S. Department of Education uh, about uh, the testing waiver um, for this year, for the current school year. 11.13 is a, a recommendation of the superintendent to participate in the ACES uh, cooperative pricing system for um, computer software and services. And that is it. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to approve items 11.01 .01 through 11.13? Can I just ask you? I have a question about 11.04. Can you key that up? Uh, hang on just a second, Bob. Let, let's get the motion in the second. We'll then go to questions. Okay. okay. Second. Okay, thank you. Now, questions. <laughs> go ahead, Bob. Uh, for the Hardenberg Insurance, can you, can you bring that agreement up? There's one paragraph there that didn't make sense to me. Uh, yeah. They get down. It's like the paragraph four or something like that. Yeah, paragraph four. I don't understand. It says if we get if if we get coverage. If we place coverage outside outside the fund, the beginning of the paragraph says that we have to pay them. At the end of the paragraph to me, it says like we don't have to pay them. Am I missing something there? Now that looks okay, Bob. Uh, what, what they're <laughs> saying is uh, that for the coverages we're placing with them, uh, they're gonna get the 9% service fee. For coverages that we place outside of uh, their, if they have to place coverage outside of the self-insurance funds that we're in, uh, they will earn a commission that would be earned for those policies that they place, uh, a builder's risk policy, uh, I don't know, a bond maybe, uh, that would yeah, be placed in Oakland, outside. In Oakland, you don't have any of those, um, in Collingswood, oddly enough, they do have one. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen our geese chasing dog in Collingswood. Um, that little dog that runs around and chases the geese on all of our property. Um, we couldn't get a GIF in the state to um, write coverage. Hmm. So it, this actually doesn't apply to, to Oakland, but to, to Bill's point in Collingswood, we actually get, had to um, go out and get coverage just to be on the safe side because we do employ a dog. Um, that's outside of this coverage, but that's the only okay. example I can think of. You know what, Bob, Bob, what you're saying there is, is if they place the coverage, they get the commission. If yeah. we place the coverage directly and don't involve them, uh, there's no fee for it. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it again. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to throw in real quick too, um, because I mentioned this to committee, so I just want to share it with the other board members um, on item 11.07, .07, the relief from the increased cost of the school districts. Um, so I share with uh, in committee, I'm going to abstain from that um, since I've benefited from it as a teacher. While, while I do agree that they haven't kind of held their end of the bargain um, in, you know, uh, in not making it a burden on the district, um, I fully understand and support the board uh, you know, backing this resolution, but for me, I, I feel it creates a little bit of a conflict of interest since I've benefited um, from that as a teacher. So on that particular item, uh, I'll be abstaining, but I just wanted to share that with the other board um, so you understand my reasoning for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Okay, on a roll call, please. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mrs. Falpell? Colleen is still on the call? She mouthed yes. She mouthed yes, yes thank you. Thank you. I can only see six of you at a time, so I do apologize. <laughs> I can only fit so many things on my screen. <laughs> Mrs. Butchko? Yes. Thank you. Mr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Taby? Yes. Mr. Fink? Yes. Mrs. Marmion? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Abstain on 11.07. Gotcha. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Thanks. Okay, section 12, uh, curriculum technology and personnel. Rich, how about you? All right, uh, submitting for approval this evening, uh, items 12.02 uh, through 12.04. 12.02 uh, is uh, the retirement of Jennifer McCoy. Um, 12.03 is maternity leave for employee number 10630. And 12.04 is another maternity leave for employee 10632. Okay, and the other items have nothing on them. So at this point then we need a motion to approve items 12.02 through 12.04. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, moved and second. Any questions on those items? Uh, just a quick comment, me again, sorry. Um, yeah, that's all right, go ahead. Just a, a congratulations to uh, Jennifer McCoy on her retirement uh, back in September of 93. I believe that was her first year. I was one of her fourth grade students, uh, <laughs> privileged to have her. Um, so I wish her all the best and uh, a very happy retirement. That's, I got to tell you, Todd, if she had you or her first year, I'm impressed she stayed in teaching. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? On a roll call, please. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mrs. Falpell? Yes. Mrs. Butchko? Yes. Mr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Taby? Yes. Mr. Fink? Yes. Mrs. Marmion? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. And Mr. Stotts? Yes. Thank you. Okay, section 13, uh, policy and miscellaneous. Uh, Fred, you're on. I don't know if uh, I have much to do. There, there is none there this is, month. Everything no, is a no, none. No policies this month. So that's it's a great, answer. yeah, great big NA. Right good there. job, Fred. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we then go to section 14, public participation. This is the second section. You can discuss anything you would like. Uh, we'll try and respond. Uh, if there aren't too many questions, if there are too many questions, we're going to have to. Uh, it was Collins what did yesterday, listen to the question and get back to you with answers at, at some point in time. Uh, but if there are only a few questions, we will try and answer them. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm trying not to eat dinner at 11 o'clock again tonight. So hopefully that'll work. Uh, as, as, to pro as to process, um, if everybody, if you would like to speak, if you could type your name into the chat box. Mr. Stoltz, do you want me to announce the names or can you yeah, read them? No, go ahead. You got it. All right. We have Jill Chestnut. And you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. We can. That's okay. You guys did a great job answering questions tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know you guys are not really touching on summer learning as far as um, giving specifics. But I was just um, hoping to give some feedback. Um, I, I have a five-year-old son in district. Um, he had, he's deaf. He has an IEP. Um, and just more or less speaking on behalf of all of the kids in district with um, IEPs who don't necessarily qualify for ESY, if there's an opportunity for um, group activities, um, things that kids like my son, even, you know, English language learners, kids who don't have the same opportunities, if there was a way for them to get together over the summer um, to do sort of like language based play groups, um, just sort of a continuum um, of what they're doing in preschool now, but without the pause in the summer. Um, really, that's just more or less a suggestion. 
I don't know if there will be committees forming um, to move forward, forward with this, but that's really it. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. McDowell, you, you uh, had mentioned that you haven't done anything uh, with the finalized planning on, on summer school. Uh, can that be part of your, uh, your work yes. on that? Yes, so ge generally um, the process that we're looking at this year, so it, it, it's a bit different for one, um, to actually have funds that have been earmarked for summer learning is, is a beautiful thing. Um, so we are going to be prioritizing in-person instruction and at the school level, at least for, at Oakland, um, Principal Bolden will be facilitating those ongoing discussions with the uh, instructional staff in order to identify the uh, right balance of programming based on the needs that are coming from the teachers. So um, that planning process is, is getting ready to begin. Um, and I, we, we, captured, um, we captured your, uh, your feedback, uh, but I, I believe that included in that process and, and, and Ms. Golden, please correct me if I'm wrong, will be opportunities to engage our families um, once we have drafted some ideas about what we're thinking in terms of summer learning. Thank you, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, um, Brett Battaloni. Hello. Hello. Hey, Brett. Good. I, my question was um, this rollout plan. Now, I know we got two separate boards, Oakland and Collinswood. Now, did our Oakland board have any participation in this rollout? Or is this all just by, like, you know, our new superintendent and whoever? You know, I, that was my question. And do we have, can our board vote differently or whatever, you know, to get our kids back over the Collinswood public schools? So that was basically my question. Uh, okay, uh, I, I'll take a brief stab at that. Uh, Collinswood and Oakland, as you mentioned, are in fact separate districts. Uh, we can go our own separate ways, uh, although we're, we're basically tied together at the hip. Uh, the, the planning is uh, the bailiwick of uh, uh, Dr. McDowell, uh, and I'm not sure that it would be feasible to come up with two separate plans uh, so my, my thought is that uh, we'll, we'll track uh, fairly closely with Collingswood, but it is possible uh, that, I don't know, Oakland, the Oakland school could open and Collingswood's elementary schools will not be able to, but that's, that's I think, going to be a little bit down the road, and that's going to be uh, uh, Dr. McDowell's bailiwick. So let me, let me provide some clarity, because I, I want to clear up the misperception or misunderstanding about how decisions are made. So first and foremost, um, the superintendent, although the superintendent has the managerial authority to make unilateral decisions, it would not be in the best interest of either school district for that to take place. So therefore, I do not operate in that capacity. I work very closely with the uh, Collingswood Educational Association leadership, the Collingswood Principal and Supervisor Association, which uh, Principal Bolden um, is a contributing member, although she's not a Collinswood employee. Uh, uh, Principal Bolden is at the table for any and all meetings, both at the district level and at the school level. And, and specifically, the president of the Oakland Educators Association is also seated at the table. In addition to district leaders, um, as well as school-based leaders, PTA leaders, community members, and, and the like. So these decisions are not being made in an office by one entity. They're being made by a much larger collective group of leaders factoring in all of the decisions that need to be made based on those four consideration groups of teachers, support staff, families, and students. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm clearing that up that we're not operating within a vacuum. Um, we are in constant communication and feedback loops on an almost daily basis between board members as well, um, between both school districts and uh, staff and leaders within both school districts. Okay, thanks, Fred. Brett, does that uh, do what you need for the moment? Yeah, that was great. Okay, I'll just make another comment real quick too with the grants that you guys are receiving. Um, is it possible to like guys can look into possibly like, you know, like better webcams, you know, for like the classroom so the teachers can, you know, teach more on the board or whatever, where it can get more of like, a, you know, a, um, 
a better interaction. I, yeah, I can take that. Um, but yeah, that's probably going to be one of the items we talk about. I think one of the allowable uses is increased uh, technology needs. So if we needed additional Chromebooks or hotspots or anything that the teachers needed um, to provide greater access um, to everyone. So that is one of that is one of the allowable uses that the DOE has actually um, said that we can use the funds for. So I believe that will be on the table for discussion. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have Laura Patrick up next. Hi, I'm Hello. Laura um, and I had a few questions. Um, one of my questions has to do with the SEL curriculum and I was wondering what the goal of SEL is in our school. Okay, I'm out on that one guys. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Michelle or uh... I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass that over to Principal Bolden. Okay, well, we've done two presentations on it already and there's a ton of information on our website. So that is actually something that I would like to discuss with you at another time because it's quite lengthy. Um, is, there, is there some kind of like um, standards associated with? I can actually send you a document tonight that summarizes the entire program and gives you a little blurb about all the different units and what the goals and objectives are. Okay, I mean, I, I personally think that it could be doing harm um, to some of the kids. It seems to be overly sensitive to their feelings and we're sending our kids to school to learn not to be shaped into, you should feel this way in this time and this is how you need to act and behave. You know, as parents, we raise our kids to behave so I feel like they, yeah, I don't I'm not sure where you're getting that information from, but we're not teaching them how to feel at all. We're teaching them how to deal with feelings. And that that's highlighted in the summary of the program to deal with their know, own personal feelings. I'm home with my kids all the time. I, I hear everything that goes on on their Zooms. I hear the SEL with them and it's always feelings. Always yeah, it is about feelings. Yes. Feelings. I just think it's an overkill of their feelings. That's all. And just just so you know, too, that. That program is mandated by the state of New Jersey, not not the nuts and bolts of it, but an SEL program is required to be taught in every school district in New Jersey. Okay, so, I mean, I was just, I just had a question about it because I felt like it was a little much. Yeah. I'm gonna send you information for sure. I will make sure you have everything you need. And if you want to set up a time, we can actually discuss over Zoom and talk about it if you have specific questions about specific units or lessons. I'd like okay. to do that. Um, Am I allowed to ask about a curriculum next year or do you want to send me an email on that as well? You can ask about a uh, next year. I don't know what you're referring to. I, I know that there's been a few meetings regarding like, I guess, faculty meetings, at least one about curriculums for next year. And I was just wondering if um, like it'll be posted online anywhere where we can see. Our, our curriculum isn't changing. We're just discussing how we have to modify it in order to meet the unique needs of the kids based on what they've learned this year and what they have to learn next year. And our curriculum is- What I'm asking is, is it gonna be available for me to see the modifications? Uh, yes, it's available online all the time for parents. That's also okay. on our website. I just, I had difficulty finding it last night. Okay, I can direct you to that. Um, another question I had was at some point when the kids do start to get back into school, when like we go to a restaurant, we sit at a table, we get to take our masks off. Is that something that the kids could do that they could take a mask off when they're at their space and then when they have to move about, they put it back on? Okay, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at that one. And if the CDC says that that's fine, that's fine. If the CDC tells uh, everybody to wear masks, uh, that's not fine. They'll have to be wearing masks. So let me okay. let me let me put this in context. So one of the reasons why um, one of the strategies that has been recommended and used widely in the midst of the pandemic is that very reason was that when there were uh, rigid mask mandates, um, extended periods of time where children weren't weren't able to wear a mask were not recommended. Which is why um, many of the uh, the schools around the country uh, shortened the school day in order to be able to account for that. We, um, I mentioned earlier within the school reopening presentation is that we are uh, gonna be working with a local team 
um, of uh, doctors um, and public health officials to help us kind of wade through uh, some of the, the guidance in order to, um, to make it more, make more localized decisions. So that is, that's getting ready to begin. So we'll be able to answer that very, very soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Paulina Akers. Hi, I'm Paulina Akers. I have two kids in a district, one in first grade and one in fourth grade. I'm also a nurse. And I was just wondering, what is um, the transmission rate in the Collinswood and Oakland School District for um, COVID? Is that like something that we can see? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Sorry, am I breaking up? No, you're okay now. Okay. Um, I was just wondering um, if we have like the transmission transmission rate statistics for the school district for Oakland and Collingswood because um, I'm just wondering why all of the other districts around us are opening up with all these re restrictions in place and Dr. McDowell is saying we're in a red zone but I believe I mean I, I'm being told that we're in a yellow zone and um, I work at a hospital my manager is telling me we're in a yellow zone for the last two months so I don't know if there's a different different thing that we're looking at versus I know you said Camden County is in the red. I'm just a little confused, I guess. So as a region, so the Cali index, which is which is published by the State Department of, of Health, um, we are in the yellow with regards to our region, which includes four counties. So when you add up the the uh, the four counties together and you look at the actual uh, rate of cases, we fall under yellow category. When you localize it and look specifically over a seven day period for Camden County, we are straight red. And in order for us to get to yellow, we would actually need to reduce the uh, case rate by, by three. Uh, so we are three times uh, the number of cases per week allowed um, currently in order to be in yellow status as a county. So the CDC guidelines are based on county specific data not regional data. Uh, so the state has, state is looking at both, which is why Camden County public health officials have asked for us to maintain the social distancing requirements and the universal mask mandate because as a county, we are in the red. Okay, all right, I understand that now, but how come surrounding districts are able to open up more like five days, five full days where we are still doing the, uh, half days like two half days or four half days are they just not following the guidance from the cdc well that's not for me to for, for for me to say what what i would say is is that every school district has different needs and also different capacity so knowing the particulars about how they derived at their decision i would not be able to answer i would actually need to uh, i would point you to contact those uh, specific school boards and, and understand their rationale. What I would say is that both of our boards, um, both in Collingswood as well as uh, Oak Lynn, in addition to all of our uh, leaders of our different education associations are all in consensus that we should follow the science. And right now the science is, is, is really requiring us to have the universal mask mandate as well as the six foot social distancing. When the guidance changes, we will pivot and we will adjust our plans in order to, to be able to expand uh, as much as we can, as much as the guidance allows for. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was glad to hear that you were working with like the pediatric um, doctors, nurses, mental health, um, social workers. I know like a lot of, I think it was Dr. Bitt and Collins would offer his assistance to you. And I know him personally, he's a great guy. Also, a lot of my questions were answered by the board. You guys were great. This was a lot better than Collins being. I want to thank you guys. Um, thank the teachers. You guys are all amazing. Okay, thank you. Just just one little note. I hate to admit this, but I spent a lot of time today reading comments on uh, Facebook. Uh, one of the comments made was that there are 100 school districts in New Jersey that are now open uh, five days a week. And that may be true. I, I don't know. But I know there are 613 school districts in New Jersey. 
So if there are 100 of them that are open five days a week, that means there are 413 that are not open five days a week. So yeah. it, it, we can say, well, this district's open or that district's open, but you know, you, there, there are four times as many that are not open. So as, uh, uh, as Dr. McDowell said, we're following the science, we're listening to the recommendations, we're trying to keep everyone safe. And so far, knock on wood, it seems to be working. Yeah, and no, I totally get it, but I just feel like more and more districts around us are opening up more, where we're kind of staying stagnant. We're, but listen to tonight, I feel like I feel more comfortable and, um, you know, that you guys are going to keep moving forward. I just felt like we really weren't doing much compared to everybody else was like Barrington, Haddon Heights, Audubon. They're all like talking about going back more and more where we were just still staying remote. And then with the whole spring break thing, I feel like the kids aren't really going to be in school in April. That was kind of like, I don't know, a little bit of a setback, but. Yeah, we're trying. Yeah, you guys are trying. You guys are doing great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stout. Anyone else by then? Yeah, that was the last one, Mr. Stouts. Oh, wow. Uh, my dog's happy because she'll get her walk a little bit sooner. <laughs> oh, wait, somebody, wait, wait. I thought I saw. Yeah, Jen Rickards. Jen Rickards. Yes, Jen thank Rickards. you. I said the chat. I pushed a button and it went away. Jen Rickers, please. Hi, I actually had more of a comment than a question. I I wanted to say that uh, a huge thanks to our teachers and all of you for listening and kind of having your ear to what is going on and making adjustments and being listen, being able to listen and discuss and uh, share all the information you have. Obviously, this is very tricky. Um, and so many of us live in this tiny little community and, and do so so well um, that when things get difficult, it's nice to know that the people that we are entrusting um, to make the best decisions are doing so. So thank you to all of you, the board members. Uh, I appreciate Dr. McDowell, your flexibility and your tireless work ethic because I don't know how you're doing this, quite honest. And you also as, as well, Beth Ann. I mean, I know we've all been on meetings and we've all been doing and there's lots of talk and a lot of that talk is behind the scenes, but it's nice that you are making a very transparent effort to put it out there and put some of the parents at ease. So thank you for that. Uh, Steph Moh Mohan. Here, Steph. Steph. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, now I can, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Steph Mohan. I have two kids at the school that you probably saw if you watched the talent show. They were in the movie Airbugs. Anyway, oh, I was very good too. Thank you. So my son Dylan in second grade is really struggling with um, online learning. Not a lot of self discipline in most second graders, but it's like very low in him. So I'm trying to get him back in person as much as possible. Um. On that note, I know that we have to, at this time, abide by the CDC recommendations of six feet spacing. But in our school, we have a lot of empty space that's not being used. And I was wondering if it would be possible to use spaces like the gym and the cafetorium and the media center if we needed, or could we use them to bring back more people in person? Uh, Principal Bolden, you want to share what what uh, the dis discussions that are taking place um, by the faculty? Sorry, I was sending the email to Ms. Patrick. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> sure. Um, in interest of getting as many kids yeah. who would like to return to hear person, that. Yeah. Um, how about we use spaces that are not being used um, other than classrooms? Could we use the gymnasium, the cafetorium, um, the media center yes, for we, um, classroom space. We are using every space that is available to us because those other spaces are being utilized for other purposes right now. So for example, the cafeteria is being used as the only spot for gross motor activity for some of our younger students. It's also the Just Kids program, early morning 
and in the afternoon, so we would not be able to house classrooms in there. And the gymnasium is actually our, um, it's actually our quarantine room and the one office in the gymnasium when a child does become symptomatic, we have a quarantine room that's required by state. So that is in one of the offices. And in addition, um, the gym space has been used for just about everything else from things like picture day to more gross motor space. Um, there's just a lot of things that come up during the school day that you also need additional space for. And we really only have those two areas. The media center is being used as a classroom, but it's being used as a small group classroom. So that's where a lot of the academic support teachers will take small groups of students and meet with them, or my speech teacher will take students and meet with them. So we are utilizing the media center in various ways right now. So as far as those three areas being our biggest spaces that we could possibly utilize, mm -hmm. they're just not available for classrooms. But we have had other larger rooms in the building where we have moved people to this year to maximize that space. Okay. And the converse, conversations taking place about bringing kids back four days a week are ongoing daily. So anytime a parent makes a request or a teacher feels a student needs um, extra additional in-person in instruction, we discuss it and we try to get back to the parent. Now we have some parent requests, you know, kind of waiting because we got to figure out these hybrid numbers. We got to make sure who's coming back third marking period and if we have enough room. Um, but I will get back to each and every parent who has requested the four full days to let them know if we will be able to accommodate them or not. Um, they will know that answer at least prior to spring break. It will probably take place uh, maybe right before or right after spring break. Okay, thank you, really appreciate you. it. And Ms. Patrick, I uh, just sent you your email. <laughs> Can I just add something? I, I just wanted to say that as a parent too, um, I really encourage my fellow parents to be in touch with the teachers in the nation about your individual kids' needs. Um, I can't say enough how supportive I think that they have been. Um, so, you know, we're, we all are really in this together, so do communicate. Okay, Mr. Stotz, I think Steph was the last person. Okay, good. Uh, Jen, can I ask you one question? Are you still in the board office or in the uh, office? Yes. <laughs> There's dedication. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing that. Okay, uh, if there's no one else, then uh, we're up to the item 15, which is the adjournments. Anybody want to adjourn? If so, make a motion, please. I just want to oh, I'll quickly point out that we're, we're one hour ahead of schedule from, from, from Collinswood. Oh, well, we, we can talk a little bit amongst ourselves. Uh, one hour, seven minutes, Jimmy. One hour, seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have a second on the adjournment? Second. second. Okay, all those in favor. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Opposed? Okay, meetings adjourned. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, everyone's input and uh, your time.